I've always had a love-hate relationship with my job as a park ranger at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. I was born and raised in the park's majestic surroundings, and while there's no denying its beauty, there's also an unsettling air about it that makes the hairs on my arms stand up, especially when I'm out on patrol alone. It all started one early morning when I received a call about strange noises coming from the eastern part of the park. Yeah, said a man's gruff voice from the other end. It's almost like someone screaming in pain or something. All right, sir, I'll go check it out. I assured him before hanging up. Now, strange incidents have been part of my job ever since. Wild animals get into things. Campers played pranks, but something about this just seemed off. As soon as I reached the location of the disturbance, I knew something was terribly wrong. Red streaks marked various spots on the ground in trees. It looked like someone had been dragged forcefully through the area. My breathing became rushed as an odd smell tickled my nostrils. My gut told me that this was no ordinary situation, but little could prepare me for the sight that awaited me at the end of this grisly trail. A man lay crumpled against a tree trunk, his body mangled beyond belief. It was clear that he had been attacked by something vicious, not merely torn apart by wild animals or injured in an unfortunate accident. A feeling of goosebumps crawled up my spine and settled into my heart like icy needles. I radioed for backup and started searching for any evidence of what could have caused this gruesome scene. That's when I heard rustling in the bushes nearby and saw an utterly terrifying creature step into view. It had distinctively long limbs that stretched out at unnatural angles, while enormous claws adorned its hands and feet. The beast's eyes were a frighteningly unnatural shade of yellow, peering at me through stringy, matted hair that hung in front of its gaunt, disfigured face. An involuntary gasp slipped from my lips, causing it to catch the attention of the creature, which turned to survey my presence. My body went numb with pure fear as I found myself unable to move under the sinister glare of its cold gaze. It stood there for what felt like an eternity before releasing an inhuman snarl that sent chills down my spine. The creature suddenly lunged forward, and my instincts finally kicked in, forcing me to leap out of the way just in time as its claws tore through the tree trunk where I had been standing mere seconds before. I scrambled back to my feet, only to find the beast circling me slowly with an unnerving intelligence in its eyes, as if calculating its next move. My desperate mind searched for ways I could possibly escape or defend myself, but how could a mere park ranger be prepared for something so monstrous? We never learned about things like this in training. The only weapon I had on hand was my trusty hunting knife, but would it be enough? P please, I stuttered, trying to reach some semblance of logic within me. I don't know who you are or what you are, but you don't have to do this. This pathetic attempt at diplomacy fell upon deaf ears. The creature merely tightened its stalking circle. Suddenly, I heard sirens approaching, talons scraping against metal echoed through the air as the creature scrambled up a tree and disappeared into the park's shadowy depths. The relief I felt vanished nearly as quickly as it had appeared, replaced with a growing terror over what strange fate awaited not only myself but also those who dared venture into this place where darkness seemed to breed such unspeakable horrors. A group of heavily armed officers arrived shortly after, guns drawn as the fear in their eyes mirrored my own. As I stood with the officers, I recounted what had happened in the park. They listened intently, their expressions growing more severe with each detail. After my retelling, they began to sweep the area in search of the creature. While they attempted to find the beast, 
I tried contacting my co-workers to warn them of the danger. Surprisingly, none of them answered their phones or radios. I couldn't fathom why they wouldn't respond. Were they already victims of this horrifying creature? The anxiety gnawing at me grew stronger with each passing moment. Searching through files and records, the officers found no previous reports accounting for anything remotely resembling what I had described. The possibility of an undiscovered species crossed our minds, but none of us dared speak it aloud. With every failed search attempt, I could see their skepticism gradually mounting. The next couple of days passed in a tense blur as more people went missing within the park. A press conference was held by the police department. It was there that they announced their decision to close down the park indefinitely until the disappearances were resolved. The public response was akin to mass hysteria. Everyone was fearful for their families and friends. Despite my lack of experience in such a matter, I volunteered to assist the officers in searching for survivors and the mysterious beast. As we delved into our investigation throughout these hardships, bonds began forming between us. Our shared turmoil strengthened our resolve. Our search eventually unearthed a hidden cave obscured deep within an untouched section of the park. Venturing inside with flashlights and weapons drawn, we discovered a collection of bones littering the cave floor, a gruesome sight indeed. Vividly splashed across the walls were crude drawings depicting a half-human, half-animal beast eerily similar to what had attacked me that fateful night. A sense of dread washed over all present as reality sank in. Whatever this thing was had hunted within these woods for a considerable amount of time. There, amid the grim scene of gnawed bones and morbid artwork, we came upon the remains of one of my missing co-workers, mutilated almost beyond recognition. Her agonized expression unleashed a powerful surge of combined sorrow and anger in me. We had to find this creature and end its reign of terror. As night fell, the creature struck again, taking two officers while on patrol. Their screams resonated through the darkness, fueling our determination tenfold. Rigorous planning sessions led to the formation of an ambush, a trap designed to capture or eliminate the enigmatic beast once and for all. We've been keeping the park locked down for several days now. Armed with only our resolve and as much firepower as we could carry, our team prepared for an uncertain confrontation against this unknown adversary. At last, the night arrived when our bait was set, a dummy rigged with trip wires and concealed alarms. Keeping watch from behind our hiding spots, we waited with bated breaths for whatever might dare slink from those malicious shadows. Tension was palpable within our group. It settled over us like an oppressive weight, matched only by the inky darkness we found ourselves submerged in. During an interminable stretch of silence permeated only by shallow breaths, we felt fate itself pressing down on us. The moment arrived when alarms blared, announcing the presence of our quarry. Quick to act, floodlights were activated, imprisoning the beast within a cage of light. Squinting into sudden illumination revealed a far more horrifying visage than what memory had preserved. It was every bit as monstrous as I had initially feared. We opened fire in unison as its full attention rested on the trap. Its hideous form flailed under our assault, desperation evident in its vicious thrashing, before ultimately falling still in death. Exhausted but triumphant, we approached the creature's carcass cautiously, weapons still raised. While closer inspection unveiled an array of disconcerting physical traits, it was impossible to shake an inexplicable primal human connection elicited by its gaze. The fathomless eyes of a creature known in whispers as the Wendigo would haunt us forevermore.
For as long as I can remember, I've always enjoyed the quiet solitude of the outdoors. I guess that's why becoming a park ranger at White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire was an ideal job for me. Most people would find it weird that I enjoy spending days on end without any human contact, but I've come to appreciate my rustic, off-the-grid life in nature. However, little did I know that being isolated deep in the forest would eventually lead me to one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. It all started like any other day. The blue sky stretched above me like a giant canvas, and the air was crisp and clean. As I patrolled through the woods along various trails, I came across something jarring, an eerily empty campsite. The first sign that something was amiss was the smell that filled my nostrils, pungent and nauseating, like rotting meat mixed with burned hair. What puzzled me was that the fire pit had a thin layer of ice. The charred logs were long cold despite the supplies untouched, pots and pans ready for cooking, food supplies strewn around. But what struck me as even more peculiar was that there were no footprints leading to or from the site. It's as if whoever had set up camp vanished into thin air. Feeling uneasy about this discovery, I decided to radio back to headquarters for backup. However, all I got was static noise, no response. Despite this, I knew protocol, leave no stone unturned. Pacing around like a detective, first making sure not to disturb potential clues, I noticed splatters of blood on nearby tree trunks with deep gashes on their bark. The trail of unsettling evidence led further into the dense wilderness. My heart beat a little faster with each step, but my protective instincts heightened. I couldn't help but feel responsible for anyone who might have gotten hurt or worse in the national park under my watch. As I marched deeper into the woods, the temperature grew colder, and an uneasy feeling crept over me. Occasional strange thudded sounds felt closer than they actually were but paranoia infiltrated my mind. Night was fast approaching, making it nearly impossible to see without a flashlight. Suddenly, I stumbled upon an eerie scene that made my blood run cold, a partially consumed human leg with too many bite marks to be any ordinary animal attack, and not far off, discarded clothes and more organically stained tree trunks. Fear slowly cascading down my spine sent chills through every muscle, but practicality took over. I quickly snapped pictures as evidence. Just as I straightened myself up, the scariest thing happened. A haunting scream echoed through the desolate forest. Horror gripped me, and adrenaline surged through my veins. Without even thinking about it, I sprinted in the direction of the whale armed only with my flashlight and that primal urge to protect whoever was in danger. As I weaved through boulders and crossed shallow streams, the sounds of distress grew closer and more anguished. Each one crescendoed closer to an unbearable level. Suddenly it stopped. Legs rooted into the ground upon reaching a clearing. The sight that greeted me cannot be unseen. A creature stood over an empty-faced body, flesh ripped from parts by mercilessly sharp talons. Droplets of red adorned its grotesque form as it made that haunting noise once again, lifting its head to reveal endless rows of razor-sharp teeth coated in blood. My body froze as our gazes locked. That predatory glare took control of every inch of my nerves. My flashlight flickered, and I realized the batteries were running low. My instincts told me to run far away from the creature and the mutilated body, but I could not abandon the poor victim. In a panic, I tore off my jacket, hoping to wrap up some of the severed limbs in it. The creature lunged at me but missed by inches as I dodged out of its way. I scrambled to pick up the flashlight that had been dropped in my haste. Desperate for help, 
I grabbed my phone and tried to call the authorities, but there was no signal in the forest. It was then that I noticed another person in the clearing. A woman stood near a tree, staring blankly at the scene before her. Shock seemed to have rendered her immobile. The creature noticed her too and shifted its focus away from me. I shouted at the woman to run, but she was too frozen with terror to respond. Instead of running towards her, which could provoke an immediate attack, I tried another tactic. I threw a rock at a nearby bush to create a distraction. The noise caught the creature's attention for a brief moment. That was all it took for the woman to snap out of her trance and make a break for it. As she ran past me, I grabbed her arm, and we sprinted together further into the forest. The agonizing sounds of conflict faded behind us as we put distance between ourselves and the horrifying scene we had just escaped. For hours we ran and hid, doing our best to make as little noise as possible. We could still hear an occasional scream or crashing of tree branches fading further into the forest, indicating that the creature was hunting elsewhere. At last, exhausted from our escape and with daylight breaking through the dense canopy above us, we were finally able to call for help when we reached a point where my phone found a signal again. Rescuers swarmed the area in search of other survivors as well as the terrifying creature. It took them days, but they eventually found it and managed to subdue and capture it, discovering within the process that it had attacked many others previously. Their investigations revealed that this beast had been living in the forest for years, or perhaps even centuries. For generations, people who ventured into the woods would often end up disappearing or suffering great injury at the hands of something unfamiliar and monstrous. The stories became distorted over time, with details lost, added, or exaggerated until the creature became part folklore and part cautionary tale. The woman I had saved, Lauren, later told me that she had been camping with a group of friends when they stumbled across an injured hiker. Following the sounds of distress led them to the creature's lair, where they found that unfortunate human leg. The creature ambushed her friends one by one before she escaped, only to freeze upon seeing me. In time, we learned to cope with our traumatic experience and became reluctant witnesses to a dark piece of reality most people will never know. Authorities have bound and secured the creature, doing their best to keep its existence hidden from public knowledge. They built barriers around the forest, and posted warnings claiming dangerous wildlife presences to keep curious individuals from getting too close. Remembering those left behind in that forest, we tried to honor their memories by helping others avoid such a chilling fate. And though we sought solace in each other's company and understanding in regard to our experience, we never forgot that meeting with the monstrous creature, known only as a Wendigo stalking its prey among those desolate woods. I always had an odd habit of whistling while walking, not that famous tune people associate with happiness, but the first song that would pop into my head. You'd be surprised at the mix of melodies I came up with on my camping trips. My friend, Emiliano Thompson, often joked that he could guess my mood based on the tunes. It was August 1999, the best time of year for camping with friends in Desolation Wilderness, California. Our group of friends included Leah Smithson and Frank Wu. We all agreed to spend a few days away from work and chaos and just unwind in nature. On our second night, as I lit the fire, we gathered around, roasting marshmallows while sharing our favorite campfire stories. Suddenly, we heard strange noises deeper in the forest, a mix of shrill shrieks and gut-wrenching wails. 
We exchanged puzzled glances and started to speculate on what it might be. Was someone else camping nearby? Or perhaps some nightbirds? Leia seemed quite perturbed by the sound and insisted we check it out, but Frank brushed her concerns off with another theory. Could just be animals scavenging or fighting, he said nonchalantly. Nothing to worry about. To lighten the mood further, Emiliano made a joke about nature's not-so-pitch-perfect harmonies. We all laughed uneasily but decided to call it a night. The following day, we went hiking and barely gave any more thought to those eerie sounds. But as night fell again, we found ourselves sitting around the fire when the cries from deep within reappeared, this time louder than before. This time was different. It felt like whatever was making those sounds had drawn closer to us. In an almost panicked voice, Leia said, Do you think it's something to do with that urban legend we've heard about? The one with that unknown creature that supposedly hides in these woods? I could see Emiliano and Frank both suppressing their unease and making a playful bet on who would have to go alone to investigate. But we were all too anxious to actually move an inch from our campfire. Moments later, the noises stopped as abruptly as they had begun. The sudden silence was almost deafening, and we froze in place, waiting for anything else to happen. Then we heard it, the sound of breaking wood followed by dragging nails tearing through the grass. Nervously, I whispered to my friends, We must stick together. Don't make any sudden movements. Let's grab some flashlights and just back away slowly. As we moved away from the fire, our flashlight beams sweeping around us, they suddenly caught something that made my blood run cold. What I saw wasn't human. It was large, covered in matted hair that looked as though it hadn't been touched by human hands for years. Its eyes seemed pitch black and devoid of emotion. It let out a guttural howl while standing on its hind legs and lunging towards us. We screamed in unison as we realized this creature might be the source of all those awful noises we'd been hearing. My first thought was to call for help but there wasn't even a hint of a cell phone signal this deep in the wilderness. In that moment, all we had were our natural instincts and our friendship. We have to run! Emiliano cried out, fear streaking through his voice as he realized our fate was now hanging in the balance. As was the case with life and death situations like these, where primal instincts were imperative for survival, split-second decisions were made. As we scattered in different directions, trying to escape this horrifying creature that seemed unstoppable, it wasn't long before the creature's attacks began to take a toll on our bodies. Frank was the first one we lost track of when he tripped and couldn't get up fast enough. Emiliano desperately tried to help him, but by then the creature had already caught up to them. With no time to spare, we all had no choice but to keep running away as fast as we could. Leia and I somehow managed to stick together as we sprinted through the forest. Our breathing grew heavier and our legs became weaker, but there was no time for rest. The creature was relentless in its pursuit, and stopping meant certain doom. It seemed like hours had passed when we finally came across a small hunting cabin. Hoping for any chance of safety, we rushed inside and locked the door behind us. Sweating and panting, we started searching the cabin for anything that could help us. Leia found an emergency radio tucked away in a dusty cabinet. She switched on the radio and immediately started trying to contact anybody who might be able to offer help or rescue. We were both aware that even if somebody heard us, it would likely take them quite some time to reach our location. While Leia tried desperately to call for help, I kept an eye on the small window of the cabin. The creature had disappeared from sight, but I knew it was out there somewhere, waiting for an opportunity to strike again. Fortunately, 
after what felt like an eternity of frantic calling for help on the radio and fearfully watching the darkness outside, we received a response from a nearby search and rescue team who said they were on their way. They advised us not to go outside under any circumstances until they arrived. The agonizing wait continued inside that isolated cabin in complete silence. We could hear movement outside, branches quickly snapping or leaves being pushed aside. The creature's presence never strayed too far from the small structure that protected us, and each sound reminded us of the horrifying reality just beyond those thin walls. Finally, after what had seemed like an eternity, we saw distant flashlights through the window and heard the distant sound of human voices. Ray continued communicating with them on the radio to ensure that they knew where to find us. As their voices grew closer, our hopes soared, and we prayed that this nightmare would soon come to an end. The team of search and rescue professionals arrived at our location moments later, sternly instructing us to remain inside while they searched the area for any signs of the creature. We clung to each other in relief that help was finally here. The team wasn't able to locate the creature during their search, but they assured us it would be best if we were evacuated immediately. Once we were safely with the rescue team, we were brought back to civilization. The loss of Frank and Emiliano weighed heavily on our hearts as we gave our statements to local authorities. They took our accounts seriously and began combing through the woods in search of any trace of Frank, Emiliano, or the terrifying creature that had claimed their lives. In those following days, Leia and I clung to each other for support while trying to process everything that had happened. The horror of what we witnessed in those dark and twisted woods would stay with us forever. As time passed, others returned from those same woods with similar tales. Some spoke of strange footprints. Others told stories of friends being carried off by large, hairy creatures. Investigations would continue on for months after our ordeal. But despite extensive searching, no answers were found. News media reports speculated about possible explanations for what we'd experienced. Some called it a rogue animal, while others suggested something more sinister lurking behind tall trees. The one thing I'm certain of is that there are things out there, creatures unlike anything I've ever seen before, that remain shrouded in mystery, lurking within the darkest corners of our world. All we can do now is remember Frank and Emiliano with love and admiration while praying that one day answers may be found for those who have endured this unimaginable terror. My buddy Cole and I had always been avid campers. We would throw our gear into the back of my beaten up, rattling pickup and set off once a month to explore some remote areas of the United States. That chilly November of 2006, in search of tantalizing tales and adventures, we arrived at an isolated campsite deep within the dense woods of Maine. No signal again. Cole groaned, checking his phone for what felt like the millionth time since we embarked on this journey. Are you sure we're not lost? Relax, man. I laughed. Who needs technology to have a good time surrounded by nature? If cavemen survived without it, so can we. Cole reluctantly smiled at the joke. Daytime was dedicated to fishing and hiking, while evenings consisted of sitting by the fire, cracking open a couple of beers, and sharing semi-funny anecdotes. The crisp air seemed to clear our minds as we settled into our uneventful yet pleasurable routine. On the third night, as we reclined on our camping chairs by the fire pit with cups of hot cocoa in our hands, we noticed unusual noises nearby, unknown cries and screeches that seemed louder than those made by common woodland creatures. The temptation to brush them off 
as mere animal sounds grew harder to resist by the minute. What you say about pitching in for rifles next time? Joked Cole, attempting to break the sudden tension. We might need them if some weird reindeer get too close. I grinned uneasily but agreed that it wouldn't be such a bad idea. The following day, after coming back from a nearby river with freshly caught fish for dinner, we encountered torn clothes hanging from random branches along the way. They looked shredded and mangled, as if ripped apart by ferocious claws rather than snagged on twigs. As this puzzling sight dawned upon us, unease crept in as we silently exchanged glances. We made the decision to pack up and leave the next morning, our nerves no longer sated by the assurance of mere animal activity. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows against the looming trees. The campfire was our sole source of comfort amid this encompassing darkness, as we braced ourselves for another night in these eerie woods. That's when we heard it, a sound more curdling than anything we'd heard thus far. It was an indescribable amalgamation of growling and chuffing, like no creature known to man. Our instincts told us to abandon our camp and run, but paralyzed with fear, we remained perched by the fire, unable to move a muscle. Moments later, it appeared from the dense thicket across from us, a monstrous silhouette at least eight feet tall. Its heaving chest accentuated its humped, fur-covered back, while its elongated limbs sported gnarled digits tipped with razor-sharp claws. Snarling sounds escaped its grotesque gaping maw filled with misaligned fangs, all indicative of predatory intent. As it advanced, massive footprints were left on the soft forest floor, belied by the ferocity of this grotesque figure that couldn't rightly be compared to any human or animal we knew. Panic-stricken and almost in unison, like some sort of pitiful comedy routine, Cole and I bolted from our chairs without any regard for our abandoned camping gear. With breaths ragged and hearts pounding out of our chests, stumbling through mud and tangled underbrush presented hazardous impediments as we pursued escape. Behind us, the terrifying creature seemed impossibly agile for its colossal size as it relentlessly pursued us through uneven forest terrain. Cole and I ran blindly through the forest, gasping for breath as we tried to put distance between ourselves and the monstrous creature. We scrambled over exposed roots and dove under thorny branches, either of us daring to look back. Help! Can anyone hear us? Cole shouted, desperate to attract the attention of any other campers or hikers nearby but our pleas for help were swallowed by the dense foliage of the forest. We continued our frantic escape, our screams muffled by the creature's guttural growls closing in on us. With no other option but to keep running, we prayed that we'd either lose the beast or reach a populated area for help. Suddenly, we burst out of the trees and onto a gravel road. Cole skidded to a stop beside me, disoriented from the sudden change in terrain. The beast crashed through the trees behind us, undeterred by our brief respite in its pursuit. Hoping that following the road would lead to some form of safety, we sprinted as fast as our trembling legs could carry us. As we ran, Cole fumbled with his pockets and managed to extract his phone. We need help. He whispered nervously into the device while trying to keep his voice steady. Please, there's some sort of animal chasing us. It's like nothing we've ever seen before. We're off the trail on a gravel road. Send someone quickly. With no response from his call for help and no time to wait, we continued down the gravel road. A faint glow appeared in the distance. As we got closer... We saw its source, a small gas station tucked away in a clearing. Almost collapsing with relief and exhaustion simultaneously, we stumbled toward it, praying for refuge from this nightmarish pursuit. 
The gas station attendant saw us coming from inside and hurriedly opened the door for us just as the monstrous creature breached the edge of the clearing. As we tumbled inside, the attendant locked the door and quickly pulled down heavy metal shutters. With our backs pressed against the door and our chests heaving with each ragged breath, Cole and I listened to the beast's enraged snarls just outside. It scratched and clawed at the metal covering, but fortunately it couldn't break through. Local law enforcement soon arrived at the scene. They were initially skeptical of our story, doubting that any animal could match the description we provided. However, upon seeing the deep gashes on the metal shutters and discovering our abandoned campsite, utterly destroyed, they began to accept that something out of the ordinary might have taken place. A hasty search party swept through the forest but found no trace of the creature. Several days later, wildlife officials reported capturing a large bear in the area. They hailed it as an explanation for our experience, but we knew better. Our nightmare was never truly resolved. We never received a concrete answer regarding what that beast was or why it hunted us so tenaciously. Disheartened by their inability to find conclusive evidence, others eventually stopped seeking answers, leaving us to grapple with unsettling uncertainty. But Cole and I forged a bond stronger than steel that night beneath those dark trees as weary survivors of an unspoken horror. We couldn't forget those who had undoubtedly fallen victim to this enigmatic terror before or perhaps after us. Their fates were forever etched in our minds along with our harrowing memories. As for me, I never ventured back into those woods again. I was enjoying another day patrolling Redwood National Park, the skies a vibrant blue canvas with what seemed like Bob Ross' happy little clouds floating around. This place was known for its magnificent ancient trees and the peace it brought to visitors, despite the thick fog that lay like a blanket after sunset. On that warm, sunny afternoon, I doubted that the night's fog would ever dare to intrude. Making my way through the park, I overheard several hikers nearby discussing something odd they had discovered during their trek through the woods. Curious enough to ignore my grumbling stomach and the call of a lunch break, I approached the group and inquired about their findings. The whole thing is just so bizarre, one man exclaimed, his hands gesturing wildly. It's like an animal tour through a campsite with no intention of taking anything, just destruction. We even found claw marks on the picnic table. His remark made me chuckle involuntarily. You know how bears are, right? Once they smell something sweet, they've got to tear everything apart looking for it. The man furrowed his brow, clearly unconvinced. These didn't look like bear claw marks, though. They were much deeper and more precise. Seeing the concern etched upon their faces, I reassured them I'd check out the campsite, even if it was probably just an overenthusiastic bear snagging dinner for its cubs. As I ventured deeper into the woods towards the rumored site of chaos, a feeling of unease crept up my spine. When I finally reached the location described by the hikers, well off any regular hiking trail, I stood gobsmacked. The site was torn apart, various camping supplies were shredded to pieces, and fragments of fabric hung from nearby branches like morbid decorations. A reeking metallic scent wafted through my nostrils, forcing me to cover my nose. It wasn't until my eyes adjusted to the shadows that I noticed the swaths of blood on tall trees, running like crimson paint strokes. Soon, I stumbled upon what appeared to be a large humanoid shape sprawled out on the ground. As I approached, any thoughts of bear antics were immediately quashed. 
The body was mangled beyond recognition, limbs twisted away from their natural position, entrails spilling out like some revolting uncooked pasta dish. I wretched behind a tree, unable to keep my stomach in check. The claw marks I'd heard about earlier were unmistakably there, deep and deliberate, gouging into the picnic table's wood as if it had been sliced by knives. Even with years of experience as a park ranger and dealing with various wildlife encounters, this sight was inexplicable. I decided that whatever had done this couldn't be far away and might be intent on harming others. Each step deeper into the murky woods heightened my senses. Every crunch of leaves or snap of twigs underfoot made me wince in sharp anticipation. The fog began creeping in like cold tendrils slithering through the trees, swallowing everything in its path. Seeing shapes form and dissipate all around me didn't make matters any better. A grotesque figure eventually emerged from somewhere in the misty forest. Whatever it was, it couldn't possibly be human. With its hunched posture and long arms dragging on the ground like grotesque tree branches, an unnerving certainty blossomed within me. This creature was responsible for the campsite's obliteration. As it lumbered towards me with alarming speed, my legs seized up, and I was frozen in terror as it drew nearer. In that moment, instinct overcame fear and spurred me into action, darting away from the malevolent figure chasing after me with striking momentum. My heart pounded in my ears as I sprinted through the fog, tree limbs scratching my face and clothes. But there was no time to stop. Each second counted as the creature steadily closed the gap between us. Just when I thought I couldn't run any further, an old, partially collapsed cabin appeared in the distance, its wooden foundation barely holding up. Without hesitation, I rushed inside and barricaded the door with whatever broken furniture could be found. I knew this temporary refuge wouldn't last for long but it gave me a few precious moments to come up with a plan. The creature crashed into the cabin wall with a force that shook the entire structure. I noticed an old fireplace on the other side of the room, filled with ash and decayed logs. Never in my life had I been so grateful to have pocketed a lighter earlier that day. I struck the lighter and set one of the decaying logs ablaze. The monster let out a guttural scream as it finally broke through the barricade. Its foul-smelling skin was dark brown and marked with deep gashes where it looked like something had hit it with razor-sharp claws, or perhaps they were self-inflicted in its rage. It glared at me with bloodshot eyes full of malice, its formidable hands clenched into fists, ready to strike. There was no time to waste. I threw the burning log straight at it, aiming for those awful eyes, hoping to at least temporarily blind it. To my surprise, the impact had an even greater effect, igniting the creature's grotesque skin like dried paper in a bonfire. It screeched in agony as it writhed on the ground, trying to extinguish itself. That was my cue, unable to keep running any longer. Gravity took over and began dragging me down to my knees while every inch of pain from before felt multiplied tenfold. Within the haze of adrenaline and fatigue, I started to drift, slipping into blackness. When consciousness returned, I found myself surrounded by several shadowy figures dressed in tactical gear. These mysterious individuals had apprehended the screeching creature without a moment's thought as a team of paramedics tended to me. The cabin was gone, burned to ashes along with the creature inside. The lead stranger, holding back my many questions, reassured me that the situation was under control. As they loaded me onto a stretcher, I caught a glimpse of the creature being secured in a steel cage. Emblazoned on the side of their unmarked vehicles read the letters GCIPS.
an acronym that meant nothing to me but would likely haunt my nightmares till my memory fades away. Before everything went dark again from painkillers and exhaustion, I noticed one last thing. Those woods were now insidiously quiet, peering back at me with morbid curiosity. As they drove away from the scene, leaving the nightmarish forest behind us, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't over yet. These people seemed to know more than they were letting on, as if there were other creatures lurking in these woods hungry for more than just survival. My life would never be the same after that horrifying encounter, forever plagued by endless questions about who or what was behind this monstrous existence unleashed from humanity's darkest nightmares. As an experienced park ranger, I've seen my fair share of odd things in the forests of Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Patrolling these ancient trails day and night has given me the opportunity to encounter strange natural phenomena, the occasional rare animal sighting, and even some unsettling evidence of human activity. But you know what they say. Anything can happen in a park. Right. So... On a particularly humid summer evening, during one of my unusually quiet treks through the park, I couldn't have anticipated just how wrong everything would go. I was conducting my routine after our surveillance when I noticed something unusual near the Ramsey Cascades waterfall. The once powerful waterfall looked pale, like a ghostly apparition was draining its energy. As I approached to investigate further, I spotted peculiar markings etched onto the rocks surrounding the falls, nothing that I'd ever encountered before. The symbol sent a shiver down my spine for reasons I couldn't explain. As unnerving as it was to uncover these mysterious carvings, nothing could prepare me for what happened next. As I squinted to better view one of the symbols, a twisted amalgamation of lines and swirls, I heard an ear-piercing shriek echo through the dense forest from what seemed like miles away. The sound sliced through my senses like a bolt of lightning. Although I've heard countless animals scream during my time as a ranger, this was something far more sinister. I hastened to locate the source of this haunting cry but was met with baffling resistance at every turn. It felt as if the forest itself didn't want me to find whatever lurked within. The air became dank and thick with an unsettling odor like burned rubber mixed with rotting flesh. It wasn't long before my surroundings began revealing more horrifying clues. Animal carcasses strewn along the trail, eviscerated and partially eaten. Their remains were horrifyingly mangled as though they had been torn apart by some monstrous creature. I continued to trudge through the increasingly unnerving landscape, jump-starting my old ranger tracker skills to follow the erratic and sporadic trail of destruction. I finally arrived at a clearing where it seemed the cry's origin lay. At least, that's what my rational mind hoped. Yet all logic had been utterly discarded at this point. In front of me were the remnants of a small campsite, completely destroyed. It looked like a tornado had torn through the area. Tents were shredded and belongings were scattered in every direction. But it was the blood smeared across every surface that unnerved me to my core. As I inspected the campsite more closely, I stumbled upon what appeared to be a journal still in some semblance of order despite the chaos around it. Flipping through its pages, I discovered entries from a group of young hikers who had ventured into these deep woods, documenting cryptic messages and eerie events similar to my own experiences. Their last entry detailed a creature, a thing of darkness with long, sinewy limbs and ghastly fangs, seemingly carved directly from nightmares. While taking in this horrifying revelation, another haunting screech echoed through the air, except this time, 
it seemed painfully close. My senses shifted into overdrive as I felt the presence of something unspeakably vile dwelling just beyond my line of sight. In an instant, the creature materialized mere feet from me, towering tall above me with its twisted appendages dragging across the ground like gnarled tree roots. It hissed vehemently, a sound not unlike its earlier shriek, as foamy saliva dripped from its razor-sharp, toothed grin. The journal's description couldn't compare to its horrifying presence. Charging against every instinct screaming for me to stand down, I lunged forward with my trusty hunting knife gripped tightly in my hand and aimed for its exposed, pulsating flesh. The knife sank deep into the creature, causing it to bellow in pain and rage, its gut-wrenching screams echoing through the night. It swiped at me with one of its grotesque limbs, and I barely managed to leap out of the way, narrowly avoiding a brutal blow that would have undoubtedly pulverized my bones. As I tried to catch my breath, I noticed two other victims of this monstrosity nearby, both mutilated beyond recognition, their blood pooling around them like gruesome puddles. Realizing that the knife hadn't even slowed the creature down, I needed to come up with an alternative plan to survive. Hey! shouted a gritty voice from behind me. I turned around to see a middle-aged man wielding a baseball bat adorned with nails. His clothes were stained with blood and sweat, but he wore a determined expression on his face. It's time we send this thing back to hell! he exclaimed making it clear that he was no stranger to fighting these horrifying creatures. Together we launched another assault. While the man swung his makeshift weapon at the monster's limbs, I looked for any weak spots on its foul body. We fought relentlessly throughout the long night. Our dizzying dance with death seemed endless. We were left bruised and bloodied but remained standing while weakening the creature much more than I thought possible. As dawn began to break, its once daunting figure now hunched over in agony, we finally saw our chance to end its reign of terror. After another swift attack and a final piercing scream, it crumbled in a heap of rotting flesh and black ichor, its nightmarish visage defeated at last. When our adrenaline-fueled euphoria started to fade and exhaustion threatened to take over, the man and I exchanged weary smiles, an unspoken bond formed by our harrowing experience. My name's Rick, he said, extending a trembling hand. I don't know about you, but I need a drink. I nodded in agreement and introduced myself. As we stumbled toward the nearest bar, my mind raced with haunting images and countless questions. Who was this stranger? How did he know how to fight it? We sat down and began exchanging our experiences with these abominations when we both suddenly fell silent. An unnerving sound drifted into our ears, another blood-curdling scream in the distance. Our gazes locked onto each other filled with dread but also steely determination, and we knew that there would be no true respite for us. As long as those ghastly creatures prowled the night, we were locked into a never-ending battle. With weary bodies and resolute minds, Rick and I stood up once more, preparing to face whatever horror awaited us. One thing was certain, this was only the beginning of our fight against these unspeakable terrors a fight that might very well consume the rest of our lives. I was standing in the heart of a dense forest with my partner, Marcus Warren, and our hunting team. We had been traveling across the globe, hunting rare and exotic animals for over a decade now. This was our life and our occupation. I knew what we were doing was illegal, but the thrill of the hunt had taken over me years ago. 
As twisted as it may sound, it was exhilarating. We arrived at this undiscovered area in the Amazon rainforest that had been known to host some of the rarest species on Earth. Or so we believed. It wasn't just any ordinary expedition. We received an anonymous tip about some lucrative prey lurking here. We had been waiting for several hours now, hiding silently behind the thick ferns and tangled vines, when we heard a branch snap from a distance. The moment we had been waiting for had finally come, at least that's what we thought. The sounds grew louder, as if something was approaching cautiously towards us. I signaled Marcus, and he raised his tranquilizer gun, ready to fire at any moment. Stay sharp, he whispered softly with an anticipation only another hunter could understand. Whatever this is, it's big. Slowly, something massive emerged from behind a tree trunk about thirty meters away from us. It was unlike anything I'd seen before, bulky yet agile, walking on two legs like a human but covered in dark fur. Its eyes were distant and menacing as it stared right at us. A chill ran up my spine as the mix of fear and excitement coursed through my veins. Nothing could have prepared me for coming face to face with such an enigmatic creature from folklore. Struggling to maintain my composure, I began to move in unison with my partner. Shouldn't we be running? One of our teammates whispered cautiously. We signed up for this. Marcus reminded him emotionlessly. Besides, we're the only ones who can confirm its existence. Before any of us could react, the creature charged at us with full force, plowing through branches as if they were nothing. Fire! I yelled desperately as Marcus fired a tranquilizer dart at the beast. It didn't even slow down. It appeared to absorb the blow as if it were nothing more than a mosquito bite. The creature lashed out at one of our teammates in response to the attack sending her flying through the air only to land meters away, screaming in pain before passing out. I don't think tranquilizers will do the trick, Marcus muttered. Maybe we should retreat. But there was something intoxicating about this dangerous encounter. I couldn't deny that my curiosity had been piqued, and I refused to back down in defeat. We continued pursuing the creature despite our obvious disadvantage. We'll find its weakness. I reassured Marcus as we pressed on. Nightfall had descended upon us, and shadows danced alongside our movements. The air grew colder and heavier with each passing minute as we moved deeper into the forest. In the distance, we heard strange noises that seemed to grow louder and more guttural as we approached. Fearing for our lives but unable to turn back now, our team advanced cautiously toward this unknown adversary, which had evaded us thus far. As we navigated through treacherous foliage and uneven terrain, questions began racing through my mind. What had brought this monstrous being into existence? Was its purpose merely to instill terror in those who came across it, or was there something more sinister at play? We continued our pursuit of the mysterious creature, which had vanished momentarily behind a thicket of trees. Our team spread out, watching each other's backs, attempting to establish a perimeter to detain it. The silence around us was deafening, and we relied on hand signals to communicate. The creature sprang from its hiding spot, seizing one of our teammates by the throat with its large clawed hands. His eyes widened in shock and fear as his vocal cords were torn out by the brute force of the monstrous being. It tossed his lifeless body aside like discarded trash and turned its attention toward the rest of us. There was nowhere to run, so we did the only thing we could fight back. Together, we attacked in unison, using every available weapon at our disposal. My own gun was useless against the creature, 
It simply shrugged off each bullet that struck its thick hide. As one by one my teammates met brutal ends within the grasp of this nightmarish fiend, we realized that calling for help would be futile. Even if someone heard our pleas, they wouldn't believe us or arrive in time to make a difference. Our desperation rose as our chances of survival dwindled. Marcus and I managed to evade the creature's attacks until only two of us remained. We kept firing at it while retreating towards what we hoped was safety. We can't defeat this thing. Marcus gasped as we ran. We need another plan. Maybe it's time to leave. I suggested, knowing that regardless of our determination, there wasn't any plausible way to take down such an adversary. But before we could follow through with our decision to retreat, a stranger emerged from the tree lean holding a book. A self-proclaimed expert in cryptids, creatures whose existence hadn't been scientifically proven, he warned us that further confrontations would only result in more bloodshed. He then revealed the identity of our pursuer, El Chupacabra, a cryptid believed to inhabit the Americas with a reputation for bloodlust. The creature we battled had strayed far from its native lands in search of an easy meal, taking advantage of the uncharted depths of the Amazon to elude detection. Unfortunately, bullets won't stop it, the stranger explained. It's resistant to most conventional means. You're better off leaving it be. Continuing to hunt it will only cause more death. Marcus and I exchanged solemn glances before nodding our agreement. Our team had suffered devastating losses at the hands of this elusive predator, and there was nothing more we could do to avenge them or complete our mission. We bade farewell to the cryptid expert and left behind the forsaken stretch of Amazonian wilderness, homesickness gnawing at our insides as we caught a final glimpse of El Chupacabra in the distance its murderous intent now turned towards other unfortunate souls. Haunted by memories of that fateful expedition, Marcus and I retired from our careers as hunters. We devoted ourselves to advocating for greater respect toward nature and the protection of endangered species. But late at night, sleep-deprived, we could still hear the cries and feel the fear emanating from those who had encountered El Chupacabra out in the unforgiving environment it called home. The creature was unstoppable, its horrifying legacy forever etched into our minds as we pondered how many had fallen victim to its malicious grasp or would continue to suffer such gruesome deaths. I had always considered myself both adaptable and adventurous, traits I inherited from my late father, an avid outdoorsman with a penchant for DIY home improvement. One thing I never had any interest in, however, was moving to the furthest corner of the United States, Alaska. Yet circumstances changed, and a unique job opportunity arose in Sitka, a small Alaskan town. So, as fate would have it, and with more than a little trepidation, I eventually found myself grabbing my belongings and hopping on an Alaska-bound plane. Little did I know that the real journey was just beginning and that it would involve much more than just packing a suitcase. Sitka is situated on the western edge of Baranoff Island in the Alexander Archipelago and offers breathtaking vistas of glacier-carved mountains and lush temperate rainforests. It's mind-boggling to me that this picturesque town could also harbor something far darker and more sinister than advertised on tourist brochures. My new neighbors were friendly enough, offering help whenever needed and inviting me to community events. However, I couldn't help but sense that they were also guarding a secret. The first month in Sitka unfolded without much fanfare as I got accustomed to my new life. 
It wasn't until the beginning of June that those secrets began to materialize. The usually mild weather took an inexplicable turn, leaving the town shrouded by thick fog for days, a highly uncharacteristic change in climate for that time of year. One Tuesday evening after work, as habit dictated, I decided to take my customary walk along the waterfront despite the unusual weather conditions. Although visibility was limited due to the fog, there was still enough light to guide me along the path at this early hour. But as I progressed farther from my starting point, I couldn't ignore a nagging feeling that someone or something was watching me, observing my movements from just beyond the precipice of the fog bank. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the dense mist. At first, I convinced myself it was just another walker or perhaps an energetic jogger. But as I continued toward home, I realized that the figure was no fellow stroller. Rather, it was a man loitering in the shadows. In an odd coincidence and for reasons I couldn't begin to fathom, his piercing eyes bore into mine with such intensity that my pace quickened, my heart pounding wildly in my ears. Days turned into weeks, and while my encounters with the mysterious figure increased, so did my unease and disorientation. Somehow embedded in those moments became a slow drip-drip of information about this stranger, an accumulation of details picked up from whispered exchanges between locals at the coffee shop or quick conversations with corner store cashiers. He was said to be vile and notorious. Not only had his reputation preceded him within the town's borders, but also throughout southeast Alaska. Terrified for my safety yet determined to put an end to this relentless stalking, I enlisted the help of some new friends, who assured me they'd stand beside me when needed. One memorable Friday night, we devised a plan to confront this person. As darkness encroached upon Sitka once more and the quiet streets assumed their customary nighttime emptiness, we set about executing our plan. Huddled together near where our sinister tormentor had been seen most frequently, we waited in breathless anticipation. Time seemed to stand still as we cast anxious glances at one another, exchanging nervous smiles and hurried words of reassurance. Just when all seemed lost and defeat felt imminent, he appeared. As he approached, clad in a tattered black coat that seemed to absorb the surrounding darkness, I recognized the sinister creep from the rumors circulating around town. His sallow face, disheveled hair, and merciless eyes would haunt one so long after encountering him. People had spoken of his barbaric actions and the numerous injuries he inflicted on unsuspecting victims who crossed his path. His name was Malcolm Simmons. As Malcolm got closer to our hideout, I signaled to my friends to be prepared for our confrontation. 7.15 p.m. was when we chose to strike. Armed with sheer determination and any makeshift weapons we could find, we sprang out from our hiding spots surrounding the menace. Malcolm! I shouted, my voice booming through the empty streets. At that moment, Malcolm seemed caught off guard, but within seconds his expression morphed into a sinister grin that stretched across his face. He spread his arms wide as if to welcome us like old acquaintances while emitting a low chuckle from deep within. What are you going to do? He taunted. You don't have the guts. We didn't let his words discourage us. We chalked it up to a bully's tactic, knowing that deep down, Malcolm wasn't expecting this level of opposition. The next couple of minutes would stay etched into our memories forever. It was a blur of action as punches were thrown, improvised weapons clashed with each other and cries of pain echoed between both parties. Malcolm fought like a feral beast, cornered on all sides. Somehow, despite being outnumbered, 
he managed to land mighty blows on some of my friends. Soon enough, though, exhaustion took its toll on everyone involved in the scuffle. A stalemate had been reached. Nobody seemed able to land another move without risking collapsing themselves. Simultaneously, realizing the impasse we found ourselves in as midnight approached made us pause and reassess the situation. Malcolm, gasping for breath, took a step back and looked around as if weighing his options. Fine, he spat begrudgingly, glaring at each one of us. You've made your point. It came as a surprise to us. We assumed Malcolm would fight to the end, but there seemed to be some flicker of self-awareness within him that recognized defeat. Leave this town, Malcolm, I said, struggling to hide the weakness and pain in my voice. We won't tolerate your terrorizing ways anymore. The standoff felt agonizingly long. None of us dared lower our weapons in fear that the defeated aggressor might seize the opportunity to strike once more. But finally, Malcolm lowered his head and turned away from us. He stumbled through the dark alley where we just fought, leaving us behind with a mix of relief and fear lingering in our bones. However, my earlier assumption about Malcolm's barbaric nature turned out to be true. In the days following our confrontation, strange messages began appearing throughout Sitka. Cryptic phrases were scrawled on walls in what appeared to be dried blood. Each time a message appeared, it was signed by none other than Malcolm himself. It became apparent that he had not left town entirely but lurked in its shadows instead. The possibilities of what he could be plotting next made anxiety spread amongst our group like wildfire. On the evening of September 12th, I received an anonymous phone call, a distorted voice saying nothing but one word, Run! I knew it had to be a warning about Malcolm. We couldn't ignore these terrifying messages any longer. However, we quickly learned that some mysteries are better left unsolved. As we regrouped and tried to formulate another plan without knowing where Malcolm was or what he intended to do next with certainty, we knew that he still had control over us. The looming threat that would always make us wonder, when would Malcolm finally end his reign of terror? And as days stretched into weeks with Malcolm still lurking out there, the thought kept crossing our minds. Had we kicked the hornet's nest? As I sat by the crackling fire, munching on a handful of potato chips, I couldn't help but share a lame joke with my camping buddies. Why do campers always carry duct tape? So one can quack low while patching things up. I burst into laughter as my companions rolled their eyes playfully. This all happened in June 2019 near Mount Shasta in the scenic Northern California region. I was enjoying a cozy RV camping trip with four fellow friends when everything changed. The evening passed by like any other in recent memory, with nothing too exciting. It was serene and quiet, interrupted only by the occasional bird song or rustle of the wind's embrace in our little campsite's surroundings. All of us were simultaneously preparing dinner and chatting animatedly about a wide array of subjects. Aaron Richmond, the creative chef in our group, taught me how to prepare foil packs for cooking over the open fire, layers of potatoes, onions, carrots, and her signature blend of mystery spices. Meanwhile, Mark Rutherford was tending to our modest yet cozy campfire. Our laughter drew the attention of a man residing further down the lane at another campsite, Timothy Jasper who decided to join our conversation. A middle-aged man with deep-set eyes bordered by crow's feet and a scruffy salt-and-pepper beard came into view while Mark was sharing captivating tales about his latest trekking expedition. 
We invited Timothy to have dinner with us since he was a solo camper and seemed friendly enough. Over shared meals and tales around our glowing fire pit, we casually got to know this stranger who carried an air of reclusiveness dressed up as politeness. Gradually, however, unease settled within me as Timothy appeared too interested in our individual stories while revealing little about himself. I couldn't help but shoot furtive glances at the stone-cold expression that accompanied his probing questions, and I felt the transition into deeper discomfort as the night wore on. Far past dinner time, I excused myself to fetch some water from a nearby spigot. As I approached the edge of our campsite carrying a muffled whisper of trepidation, I noticed an unfamiliar gleaming object near Timothy's camping area. Curiosity peaked. I walked towards it and found a trove of intricate knives laid out meticulously on a small table. My heart pounded as adrenaline shot through my body. Shaken, I quickly retreated to my friends and discreetly informed them about my discovery. They, too, were taken aback by my description of Timothy's secretive assortment of sharp blades. We all agreed that it was better not to confront the unsettling stranger and instead excuse ourselves from our own campsite with haste. An unspoken agreement passed between us, and we proceeded to pack up our belongings with forced normalcy as though preparing for an innocuous twilight hike. As we made motions towards heading out, Timothy held up a hand covered in nettle sores and inquired nonchalantly about where we were going. Petrified by my observation earlier, I could hardly utter a word and just gestured vaguely toward the forest trailhead. Luckily for me, Aaron chimed in, explaining that we decided on a spontaneous moonlit hike after finishing dinner. Timothy raised an eyebrow but didn't press further. He then mentioned needing something from his own campsite. Since we had a head start from there, Aaron urged us quietly to speed up our pace without looking too suspicious. We made our way down the trail under veiled moonlight as inexplicable fear gripped tighter at each step taken away from Timothy's watchful gaze. As we hurried along, Tim's voice seeped into the woods in quiet pursuit. Hey guys, wait up! As we picked up our pace, Timothy's voice seemed to get louder and more persistent. Guys, wait up! I'm coming too! We exchanged worried glances but continued to move away as fast as we could without making it obvious that we were trying to evade him. Just as we were about to round a bend on the trail, Erin suddenly tripped on a protruding root, sending her crashing to the ground. We rushed over to help her up, and that's when Timothy caught up with us. His eyes held an odd glint as he offered a hand to Aaron. Thank you, she said hesitantly, not meeting his gaze. Timothy remained silent and stepped back. The rest of our group exchanged looks of unease, but with no way to escape without causing more suspicion, we pressed onward. By this point, any hope for a peaceful moonlit hike had vanished. Tensions rose as each creak of a branch or rustle of leaves raised the possibility of danger. The silence between our groups seemed insurmountable. Timothy walked behind us, his eyes still casting sharp glances in every direction. Eventually, we reached a fork in the path where we decided to stop for a moment and collect ourselves. In a hushed conference, we decided that splitting up might be our best bet for getting away from Timothy. We're just going to explore this path for a bit, and we'll meet back up with you soon, Alex said quickly. You go on ahead. There's not much time till sunrise. Timothy hesitated but finally nodded in agreement, continuing down the right path while we took the left one. Once we were certain he was out of earshot, we breathed small sighs of relief before heading off in the opposite direction. However, the uncomfortable sensation returned as it started becoming apparent that someone was following us on the trail. 
paranoia set in as each shadow seemed to take on ominous shapes, and the moonlit forest transformed into a nightmare. Suddenly, we heard heavy footsteps behind us, followed by a guttural grunt. We couldn't help but glance back, only to see Timothy lunging at us with one of his knives in hand. We screamed and stumbled away from him as fast as our tired legs would carry us. Realizing that we needed help, Erin took out her phone and dialed 911 while running. There's a man attacking us. We're on the trail near our campsite, she shouted, panting heavily. The operator assured her that help was on the way, but it seemed like an eternity as we continued sprinting through the dark forest. Finally, we saw the lights of our campsite in the distance, accompanied by flashing red and blue lights. As we broke through the trees and stumbled into the campsite, police officers emerged to meet us, weapons drawn. He's chasing us. He has a knife. We yelled in unison. The police quickly spread out in search of Timothy as we collapsed onto the ground next to emergency medical personnel. Shaking and exhausted from our terrifying ordeal, we couldn't stop thinking about the fact that it wasn't over until they finally caught him. After what seemed like hours, an officer approached us with an update. We've apprehended your attacker. He had a collection of knives stashed at his campsite, some stained with blood. As shock turned to horror, he continued, we just received word that he escaped from a mental institution two weeks ago. He was serving time for multiple counts of assault. Relief washed over us as the officer walked away to give his team further instructions. We couldn't help but wonder how many others Timothy had hurt before us while holding on to some semblance of relief that his reign of terror was finally at an end. Thankfully, no one in our group was harmed during the ordeal, but the harrowing experience would remain etched in our memories forever as a reminder of the unpredictable dangers that can lurk even in places where we least expect them. The Abduction of Running River from Native Mystery Gal Believe me when I say, the world is far more terrifying than it seems. This happened to me on June 16, 2007. I'm a Sioux Native American named Ayasha Waters. I was born and raised on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I was always a free-spirited person, passionate about preserving the environment and protecting my heritage. As fate would have it, during the 2007 summer solstice celebration, I experienced a series of ultimately life-altering events. The day started with my friends at the powwow grounds, situated among vast prairies and dusty dirt roads. We feasted on fry bread tacos and laughed over old reserve jokes. My best friend Luda Redal never failed to bring everyone cheer with his comical anecdotes. As dusk approached, we ventured out into the wilderness to visit an ancient petroglyph adorned with mysterious symbols and illustrations that had puzzled our people for centuries. It always held an eerie charm for us native youths, with whispers of its cursed history echoing through generations. The deepening twilight seemed to come alive with something otherworldly in those hues of orange against receding blues, an atmosphere thickened by folklore hung heavy in the air around us. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced our laughter-filled conversation. We struggled to locate the source and discovered our friend Darcy Whitehorse writhing on the ground not far from us. Scratches and bruises strangely covered her body like markings left by whip-like tendrils. No known animal within these parts could be blamed for such unnerving wounds. Panicked by her condition, my friends and I decided that we'd carry Darcy back to her family's house to ensure her speedy recovery. Luta offered his truck as transport, 
while others assisted in carrying her along the way. Once back by Luda's truck, we noticed that his gas tank had more than enough fuel. We began to question why he hadn't driven earlier. His response was simply that it wouldn't start when we initially tried to leave. Now, with the desperation of Darcy's situation, the engine revved to life, reassuring us that we would get her quickly to safety. During our journey back towards the lighted encampment, horrifying images and questions danced in our minds. But Luda managed to lighten the somber mood in the vehicle with one of his famous jokes about a bear stuck in a honey pot. The laughter fell short as Luda stumbled upon a gruesome scene lining the road. Bodies mutilated beyond recognition were strewn like discarded rag dolls across the path ahead. Blood splattered over shattered glass made it almost impossible to identify the victims within what appeared to be a demolished vehicle. The surrounding area looked like hell itself had vomited at this grotesque display. Scared out of our minds, we tried calling for help using our cell phones, but reception was non-existent this deep into the wilderness. Darcy's waning condition prompted us to continue on without delay towards her home, where someone must have had means of contacting emergency services. We picked up speed, and our terror intensified as piercing howls pierced the night air from all angles. Shadows seemed to encroach upon us as if specters themselves meant to ensnare us within their dark folds. Suddenly, an enormous claw swiped at my side window, shattering glass and showering me with shards that tore into my skin like venomous fangs. Anguished wails mixed with growls, there was no denying whatever was hunting us possessed monstrous strength and unrelenting determination for vengeful consumption. Faced with imminent danger and unable to properly understand or identify our malevolent pursuer, Luda slammed on the gas pedal, propelling his faithful truck forward into blistering overdrive. Violent shaking engulfed the vehicle from another impact dealt by our tenacious tormentor. With each impact, we knew it was only a matter of time before the creature's relentless pursuit would overcome us. Luta swerved wildly, attempting to navigate the winding forest road while throwing off our pursuer. We could hear its snarls and the sounds of tree branches being torn apart as it tore relentlessly after us. Darcy's health was worsening quickly. Her shallow breaths and weak moans were a disturbing reminder that we needed to get her help immediately. Despite our attempts to calm her, there was no escaping the fear in her eyes. Luta spotted an abandoned cabin by the side of the road and signaled for us to take refuge there. Knowing we were out of options and desperate to protect Darcy, we agreed and stumbled into the decaying building. Once inside, we barricaded the door and windows using any materials we could find, old furniture, loose planks, even a broken refrigerator. The house continued outside sending chills down our spines as they echoed throughout the cabin. But for the moment, whatever was hunting us seemed unable to breach our makeshift fortress. Luta scoured the cabin for any signs of a telephone or radio but found none. He apologized for not calling for help earlier, when we had been at Darcy's house, but explained that his disbelief at the time had clouded his judgment. Hours passed, and eventually, daybreak began to seep past our barricades, though relief was far from being within our reach. We knew we had no choice but to try and leave. Darcy's condition had worsened throughout the night. Her labored breaths had grown weaker, while her face was now pale and stricken with pain. Carefully removing enough materials from one window so that we could peek outside without exposing ourselves too much, Luta went first while keeping watch for any signs of danger. With no other choice at this point, we decided to try and make a run for the truck, 
hoping daylight would offer some advantage against our attacker. As we opened the door and stepped hesitantly outside, the forest seemed calm. The birds sang their morning songs, entirely unaware of the terror we had experienced only hours before. Luda carried Darcy in his arms, her pain obvious but her determination not letting her succumb. We reached the truck and piled in, with Luda flooring the gas pedal as soon as everyone was inside. The engine roared to life, and we raced back to Darcy's house, this time with caution, for we knew what could be lurking in these woods. Upon arriving at her house, I immediately called 911. Within minutes, an ambulance arrived, followed by local law enforcement officers asking endless questions about the creature that had tormented us. As they loaded Darcy into the ambulance, I noticed our neighbor from down the street watching everything unfold from his porch, an odd look of guilt on his face. He approached as if he had information that might help us understand what happened better, but quickly withdrew and returned to his house. Weeks later, once Darcy was recovering and things began to regain some normalcy, I received a package in the mail containing an old book filled with local legends and mythology. It had been sent anonymously but had a cryptic message inside. Read this. It might bring you peace. I delved into the world of ancient folklore from our town's beginnings and soon discovered eerie tales of monstrous creatures thought to reside within the nearby forests. After some time, I found out that what I've encountered was a Wendigo, a mythical creature associated with cannibalism often residing deep within forested areas in cold northern climates. Let's not meet again, Wendigo. The moment I entered the eerie atmosphere of the abandoned warehouse, I realized that my sarcastic remark about getting paid to wander through a dusty old building had come back to bite me. As a Marine, this mission should have been simple. Now, it felt more like an unwelcome initiation prank. My name is Mason Durant, and my best friend, Devin Foster, and I were assigned to this mission together. We'd been through hell and back as part of our unit, but strange things started happening upon reaching the warehouse, equipment malfunctioning, shadows darting out of view. This labyrinthine warehouse was chosen for a covert training exercise scheduled next month, and it was our job to scope it out. Never fails, I said. You tried to make a witty comment, and suddenly you find yourself trapped in a B-grade horror flick. Devin couldn't help but chuckle at my joke, but he remained cautious. As we ventured deeper, we noticed scratch marks on the walls that were too large and oddly shaped for any animal we knew. I'm no expert, Devin whispered, walking up to the mark and trying his best not to touch it. But wild animals aren't usually good at using power tools. Maybe a prankster with some serious dedication? I don't think so, I muttered as we continued on. Our surroundings worsened, smashed windows patterned with elaborate cobwebs glistened in the hazy moonlight above us. The encroaching darkness clung to every corner like an invasive mold, multiplying as we moved deeper into the abandoned structure. We stumbled upon a makeshift living area in what should have been an office space. Clothes were strewn about along with an old mattress and sticky food wrappers and sconced in filth. The air was pungent with decay. Face masks couldn't mask that odor. This place gave me goosebumps. Suddenly, skittering noises echoed through the halls, accompanied by the distant sound of metal scraping metal. Devin and I glanced at each other, gripped our weapons tighter, and advanced cautiously. Who's there? I called out, and my muscles tensed for a fight. Another unfamiliar noise echoed in response. 
It was a guttural sound that sent shivers through every fiber of my being. What living creature could create such an atrocity? A figure emerged from the obscurity, immense and terrifying. It stood well over seven feet tall and seemed to be covered in thick scales that refracted the scant light like thousands of prisms. Its eyes were as black as the void and permeated with malice. I'd never encountered something so terrifying. Devon, I choked out, trying to keep my wits about me. Let's try to scare that thing back to where it came from and then get the hell out of here. We didn't need permission to open fire. You don't have to tell me twice. He stammered as we unleashed a barrage of bullets at this unholy creature. The cacophony filled the warehouse, but our efforts had little effect. The creature scarcely flinched, with a low growl and bare razor-sharp teeth. It lunged towards us with unparalleled speed for its size, intent on maiming or devouring us alive. Devon and I sprinted in the opposite direction, watching the creature give chase. Our survival instincts were all that guided us through the warped, deteriorating corridors of the abandoned building. Time seemed to drip like melted wax as we continued our desperate retreat. Maybe we can outsmart it? Devon yelled, his voice cracking under the weight of our exhaustion. We can try. I responded, coming up with a plan on the fly. Follow me. My pulse quickened as we rounded a corner and entered a room filled with long-abandoned machinery. Climbing atop some rusty equipment, I thought we could hide from the creature and escape once it lost interest. But as we hunkered down, trying to stay silent, I realized Devon wasn't by my side. Devon! I whispered urgently, not wanting to alert the creature to our location. No response. My heart sank in fear for my friend's safety as I cautiously descended from my perch determined to find him despite the danger that loomed over us like a dreadful specter. Hearing some shuffling up ahead, I hopped between defunct machines until I found Devon limping painfully. What happened? I inquired, trying to control my nerves. Devon pointed down at his leg, where a deep gash had been inflicted during our escape. Before I could react further, that bone-chilling growl resounded through the warehouse once more. The creature was getting closer. We had to make a decision, and fast. We need help, I said urgently while fumbling for my phone. I'll call Danny and Sherry. They're not far away. The call connected quickly, and I gasped out a panicked explanation of our predicament before dropping the location pin for them to find us. Hurry! was all I managed before hanging up. The monstrous fiend appeared before us again, reeking of bloodlust and an insatiable desire to cause harm. The mutilated carcass of a squirrel hinted at its capabilities, and I knew that we were in for a torturous demise if it caught us. We held our breaths and clutched each other as the creature stalked the area, searching for its prey. It was so close that we could smell the warm stench of its breath as it snorted and grunted in disappointment at our disappearance. Never before had I been this close to being slaughtered by something so fearsome and grotesque. Moments stretched for eons as we waited, the air thick with tension. And then, miraculously, Danny and Sherry burst through the entryway, armed with makeshift weapons found on their way in. Their arrival startled the creature, giving Devon and me just enough time to break free of our hiding spot and make a run for it. The creature hesitated long enough for them to throw whatever they could find at it, ultimately buying us precious time to flee from its clutches. We raced through the labyrinth-like structure, adrenaline driving us forward despite Devon's worsening injury. Our friends fought bravely to hold back the scaly terror while we made our escape. As we stumbled out into the open air, it felt like ages since whatever fresh hair could be found nearby had filled my lungs. 
In our exhausted delirium, we heard the galvanizing thud of footfalls fading into the distance, our friends still battling that hideous beast as they covered our retreat. Although Devon and I managed to evade that gruesome ordeal with only scars and memories as souvenirs of our terrifying encounter, Danny's left arm had been mangled beyond recognition. He eventually lost it due to infection. Sherry emerged mostly intact but couldn't escape her past visitation with terror. Sleep has evaded her most nights since then. Our lives changed forever because of that harrowing night, yet we persevered. As terrifying as that monster had been, it reminded us, in the most chilling way possible, of our own vulnerabilities and how much we depend upon the intricate web of loyalty, trust, and courage woven between friends in even the bleakest of circumstances. This story is called The Unseen Moonlight Stalker, from Icy Mist 21. Let's begin. This happened to me on October 12, 2014. I don't consider myself a naive person. Growing up in the heart of Boston will do that to you. My name is Stella Hansen, and I was working as a nurse at a small suburban clinic. It was a quiet job most of the time filled with minor injuries and the occasional case of the flu. Nothing prepared me for what was to come. It started with subtle clues, things that would have been easily overlooked by most people. An unexplained series of maulings had occurred around town, and several people were horrifically injured. The authorities attributed them to wild animals or unfortunate accidents but something about those events didn't sit right with me. One day during my shift, we received a new patient who had been injured by an animal attack under suspicious circumstances. Sarah Carter, a local college student, was found unconscious near the woods with gruesome injuries and bite marks all over her body. As I tended to her wounds and tried to provide comfort, she muttered something about how it all happened under the full moon and how it was unlike any creature she had ever seen before. She shuddered when she spoke, and I couldn't help but believe that there was something unnatural behind her encounter. In the ensuing weeks, more strange occurrences happened around town, pets vanishing from their homes, small fires erupting at random locations and even some unidentifiable tracks etched into the mud. Everyone seemed on edge, but no one could pinpoint what was happening or why. At this point, I began discussing my concerns with my next-door neighbor and close friend, Cal Johnson. He opted to help me delve into this mystery. After several evenings of research in the public library's archives and whispered conversations over coffee at a local diner, we discovered something entirely unexpected. Boston, it seemed, had an extensive history of grisly incidents that all occurred under the full moon, dating back to the early 1800s. The next full moon would be in three days, and knowing we could soon have our answers, we decided to keep a watchful eye around our neighborhood. October 19th came with incredible anticipation. Cal and I agreed to meet up at each other's houses and remain vigilant throughout the night. The streets were dark as pitch as I made my way to Cal's place. Halfway there, I heard a blood-curdling scream echo through the night. Hurrying towards the source of the noise, I found Sarah Carter lying on the ground with her hands clenched around her throat, gasping for air. Cal rushed over to help me with Sarah. Her face was pale, her body trembling violently. She choked out a single sentence before passing out. Beware the unseen under the moon. As we carried her back to safety, we noticed deep claw marks etched into the trampled grass nearby. That night unraveled, 
an unsettling sense of dread had woven its way through our town as odd incidents became more frequent and bizarre. Every shadow seemed filled with malice glinting fangs hidden just out of sight. Our instincts heightened. Armed with flashlights and determination to find answers, Cal and I began patrolling our neighborhood together late into the long hours of nightfall. Eventually, fatigue drove us apart. Cal decided to head home for some rest while I continued down another street alone, my footsteps echoing louder in silence, until something caught my attention. A horrifying hissing came from a partly open garage door, as if pulled by an unseen force. I hesitated, then pushed forward slowly as the growling noise intensified. My heart pounded, fear raging inside me like wildfire. Then without warning, the garage door slammed shut inches from my face, agony ripping through the air, a blur of twisted limb flesh being devoured before my eyes at first, an indistinguishable blackened creature. But as moonlight illuminated its features, I realized to my horror that it was a grotesque, malformed figure resembling both man and beast, its maw filled with dripping gore, its claws soaked in blood. Such a frightening sight might have felled any other person with sheer terror, but all I could think of was how Cal might be walking right into this monstrosity's path. With no time to lose, I acted fast and tried to call the police to report the situation. Unfortunately, my cell phone had no signal. It was up to me to save both Sarah and Cal from this horrible creature. I knew I couldn't face it alone, but I also knew that even if I managed to rescue them, the beast would still be on the loose. Leaving Sarah in a relatively safer spot, I rushed towards Cal's house, hoping to warn him before it was too late. Just as I reached his front door, he opened it with a worried expression. Have you seen Sarah? She was supposed to meet me here, Cal asked anxiously. I quickly explained the situation and what I had witnessed. As Cal listened in shock, we debated our next move. Knowing we needed help, we decided to try our friend Peter's house nearby. He was a local sheriff and would certainly know how best to handle the situation. As we ran towards Peter's house, we heard more screams in the distance but couldn't pinpoint where they were coming from. This time, it sounded like multiple people were being attacked. We had no choice but to keep pushing forward for Peter's assistance. When we reached Peter's house, we burst through the door and found him sitting at the kitchen table. Peter immediately knew something was wrong with our disheveled appearances and terrified expressions. We relayed our story, impressing upon him the urgency of the situation. Now equipped with Peter's knowledge and police equipment, we formulated a plan. Charging back into town under the full moon's light, we knew this may be our only chance at stopping whatever terrorized our quiet community. As we moved through town seeking those that needed help first, we came across several victims scattered along sidewalks or hidden among buildings, all of them suffering from vicious bites and gashes, some barely clinging on to life. We did our best to offer medical assistance while we continued our search for the monster. During our hunt, we stumbled upon the creature caught in the act of slaughtering another person. It turned its attention to us, a horrifying mix of fury and hunger in its eyes. Peter, with professional composure and steady hands, aimed his shotgun at the beast and fired. The creature howled in pain as the gunshot pierced its flesh. It fled into an alleyway with Peter, Cal, and I in pursuit. We tracked it down a dark, dead-end alley, where we cornered it. The once-human monster writhed in pain as its features distorted and changed before our eyes. Its grotesque transformation was almost too much for us to bear. 
As we held the creature within our sights, Peter tried to radio for backup, only to realize that his walkie-talkie had been damaged during the chase. We were on our own, not knowing how long we would be able to subdue this terrible being. As it tried desperately to resist being cornered by us, we noticed a strangely familiar aspect within its features. A sudden chill gripped me as I realized that this creature was at least partly human, someone from our town who had undergone this terrible curse. We did everything in our power to restrain it and keep it from harming more people until, eventually exhausted, it collapsed on the cold pavement. We decided that containment was safer than killing it outright while it exhibited human traits. However, now we faced another challenge, protecting those around us while potentially unlocking secrets of the twisted history of our town. With shudders creeping through our spines over what might come next, we tied up the defeated creature under the deceptive safety of daylight, as werewolves can only maintain their form during nights of full moon. There I was, browsing through a bookstore on a breezy September afternoon, completely unaware of the impending nightmare that would soon unfold. Born and raised in Oklahoma City, I made it my life mission to visit all the weird and wonderful attractions the seemingly unremarkable state had to offer. This particular day, an old friend was in town and we decided to hit up a local bookstore before grabbing some food in Bricktown. As we scanned the crowded shelves for offbeat novels and obscure authors, we shared a few laughs while reminiscing about the good old days. But those joyful moments would soon turn into something dark, twisted, and terrifying. The inciting incident occurred as we stepped out of the bookstore. There, lying grotesquely across the sidewalk, a mangled mess of human limbs, was what appeared to be the lifeless body of a man. Blood soaked into his tattered clothing as stunned onlookers gathered around, many taking out their phones to call for help. Shocked by this gruesome sight, my mind raced while adrenaline pumped through my veins. What happened here? I asked aloud, unable to tear my gaze away from the carnage. No clue, but it looks like he was mauled by something. Responded a nearby man with an eerily calm demeanor. As police arrived at the scene and began questioning witnesses about the horrific event that had just transpired, my friend and I couldn't help but feel mildly intrigued. What kind of creature could have done this? The sun set quickly that evening, casting an ominous shadow over our now-abandoned dinner plans. Suddenly feeling compelled to investigate this mystery further, almost as if drawn by some unseen force, my friend and I got in his truck and headed for Tenkiller State Park, near where the mutilated body was found. Upon arriving at the park, which seemed eerily devoid of any other curious bystanders, we trekked deeper into its twisted trails, guided only by the light emanating from our phones. The darkness engulfing the path intensified with every step, with the threat of unknown peril hiding behind each twisted branch and bush. Suddenly, a faint scratching sound echoed through the darkness, and then a harrowing growl emanated from just behind a thick cluster of trees. As we cautiously approached, what appeared before us was both terrifying and unbelievable in equal measure. My heart pounded in my chest as I beheld the monstrous being. Towering over eight feet tall, the beast bore coarse, matted fur that barely concealed its sinewy muscles. Its piercing yellow eyes gleamed menacingly under an unusually elongated snout while blood-stained, razor-sharp claws swiped menacingly at the air. Despite our instincts screaming at us to run, we stood frozen, not knowing what to do or how to react. 
the monstrous being before us emanated an aura of pure malevolence. My grip on my phone tightened involuntarily as its light illuminated the terrifying form of the skinwalker. Back off slowly, whispered Jake, not taking his eyes off the creature. He didn't need to ask twice. As a group, we silently began to back away from the nightmarish figure. However, it seemed as though our attempts to leave were exceeded only by the creature's desire for pursuit. With each step we took, it matched our movements, forcing us further back into the wooded area, which had become our inescapable labyrinth. Our retreat continued with agonizing slowness until we reached an unexpected clearing. There stood a lone man smoking a cigarette. Within seconds, he extinguished his cigarette and approached us cautiously. Hey, don't panic, he said in a soothing tone. My name is Tom. I live around here, and I've heard about that Bigfoot creature you're facing. We didn't have time for long introductions, but our confusion was evident on our faces as we looked between Tom and the monstrous being that continued following us closely. You see, Tom continued hurriedly, it's been terrorizing the community for months. We've tried everything to stop it, but nothing worked until now. He revealed a battered leather book, its pages marked with careful notes and crudely drawn symbols. It took weeks of research and several failed attempts, but I finally found something that can deter that monstrosity. He flipped through some pages, revealing intricate hand-drawn runes and sigils. I could hardly believe that they held any power over such an unstoppable force. My five-year-old niece could draw better than this. I thought as he handed us a small piece of paper with the shakiest rune I had ever seen in my life. Seriously, does he expect us to believe this? Jake muttered under his breath. But fear overcame our skepticism, and we played along. Tom began chanting something in an unfamiliar language, his voice low but firm. To our complete and utter disbelief, the creature stopped dead in its tracks. Its growls diminished, and its previously focused glare became unfocused and almost uninterested in our presence. With no time to waste, Tom grabbed our hands and pulled us toward the direction where we first met him. The skinwalker appeared to simply let us go, seeming dazed by whatever incantation Tom had performed. We sprinted until we reached the edge of the woods, panting and sweaty from exhaustion. As we cautiously looked back into the darkness that enveloped the twisting maze of trees behind us, we couldn't see or hear any signs of that horrifying beast following us. Listen, Tom said seriously as he sipped water from a bottle he had with him. You need to tell your family about this creature. They need to know what they're dealing with. Without another word or even a goodbye, he turned and disappeared through a trail leading deeper into the woods perhaps following the skinwalker's origin story of his own accord. As we returned home, bruises and scratches from our nightmarish encounter painfully reminded us that this all-too-real event would forever mark our very souls. Our terrifying experience left us unable to shake off a lingering sense of dread as we contemplated how there could be more creatures just like it lurking, waiting for their next unsuspecting victims. But despite Tom's warnings for us to share our encounters with others, some events may be better left untold. As days became weeks following that dark night, something seemed too horrific for reality. Perhaps some mysteries were simply meant to remain within the shadows. That night would forever haunt our dreams, but we'd never forget what happened in those twisted trails and the monster that was watching, hiding, waiting. Shadow Stalker, from Adrian 99 
I never had a thing for bugs. This happened to me on June 7, 2004. During my time with the Green Berets, one mission took us deep into an uncharted part of the Amazon rainforest. Our squad's objective was the recovery of classified intelligence from a crashed drone. My comrades and I were equal parts excited and terrified, sharing stories of various folklore that native tribes whispered about in the region while double-checking the ammunition strapped to our chests. We had just crossed a narrow bamboo bridge after trekking for days when we heard something that made our entire team freeze in our tracks. A symphony of piercing shrieks and what sounded like tearing metal. The noises were unidentifiable but horrifyingly familiar, as if we might have heard them in every shadowy corner and howling wind, though we knew deep down we never experienced anything like it before. As the captain ordered us to scout ahead cautiously with military hand gestures, we tiptoed toward the source with guns at the ready. Suddenly, a grotesque sight came into view, a native shaman impaled on branches. He looked as if he tried to protect something, or someone, but had failed gruesomely. That's impossible, muttered our medic, Miguel. Those wounds... Nothing can do that kind of damage. Our adrenaline levels were off the charts. Every soldier knows that some things can't be fought with bullets alone. We should have called for help. But there was nothing around us but dense jungle for miles. And besides, in our years of training, nothing had prepared us for this. With no other option but to press on toward the crash drone's location... We tried to shake off what we saw by reminding one another that whatever happened was probably long gone by now. As we plowed forward through thick foliage and oppressive humidity, I noticed something unnerving. The once thriving rainforest around us seemed to be dying. The vibrant colors we'd seen upon arrival were now mostly black and gray, as if some malignant force had tainted the area. In the following hours, we became increasingly convinced that whatever killed that shaman was stalking us. Our radio expert, Paolo, struggled to keep his cool while reporting that he couldn't establish contact with HQ. I tried lightening the mood, grinning at Paolo and jokingly asking if he wanted me to give the radio a good whack next time, but his eyes stared right through me, haunted by fear. As we continued our trek through the dying forest, we stumbled upon a small, native village. The inhabitants who greeted us wore expressions of sheer terror on their faces. We tried to communicate with them, but they were paralyzed with fear and unable to provide any useful information. The captain decided it was best to split into two teams for the remaining search one headed toward the last known location of the drone, while the other stayed behind to protect and question the villagers. The radio still failed to connect with HQ as we quietly approached the drone's site. Our surroundings grew even darker and more twisted, and we noticed an increasing number of dead animals strewn about, each having suffered the same gruesome fate as the shaman. In the meantime, back at the village, our comrades discovered a mural painted on one of the structures, an unfamiliar creature ravaging a group of natives. The time-worn painting seemed like it could hold some answers to what was happening around us. But with no means to contact HQ or research further, finding out seemed impossible. The two teams reconvened at nightfall in the village after another fruitless day. Tensions were high due to our inability to call for help and frustration fueled by fear. The villagers murmured worriedly among themselves as we regrouped in a makeshift command post. A sharp cry interrupted our planning session. One of my teammates rushed into the room pale-faced and declared that one of our guards had been killed in the exact same gruesome manner as we'd seen before. 
It was clear now that whatever had caused this slaughter had marked us as its next target. No time for hesitation remained. We hastily devised a plan to evacuate whatever villagers could be led to safety and obtain the crash drone's data before escaping ourselves. It was a desperate hope that, once completed, this creature would lose interest in us. We encircled the village with sentinels posted on constant watch as we prepared for departure. With luck, any signs of danger would be spotted early. Unfortunately, our worst fears came to life in the dead of the night. A guard frantically shouted over our radio, warning us that the creature was closing in. We sprang into action, not even bothering to catch a glimpse of our pursuer. The villagers scrambled with us, desperate to escape the unseen jaws seemingly snapping at our heels. Staying together was crucial as we raced through the decaying forest with precious cargo and adrenaline pumping. In the chaos that ensued, I caught a fleeting glance of a clawed hand slashing through the darkness, grabbing hold of one of my comrades. I briefly saw what could only be described as a living nightmare that vanished just as quickly as we did from its grasp. Having escaped with both the drone and some survivors, we realized calling for help had never been an option, not because Paolo couldn't establish contact with HQ but because it felt like whatever nightmarish force hunted us was also controlling our surroundings. As we approached safety on shaky legs and caught our breaths far away from the Amazon rainforest horror awaiting those still trapped there, we mustered up the courage to piece together what we'd encountered. And in piecing these jagged memories and clues together slowly, I realized there was only one explanation. The legendary Kirupra had emerged from its slumber within the shadows of lore, marking these lands with death once again. I never thought I'd find myself in the middle of nowhere, deep in the forests of Oregon, but there I was, searching for a lost hiker, feeling like a cliché. My name's Jack. I'm a Green Beret operative with search and rescue training, sent on this mission by my commanding officer. The missing hiker had been gone for a few days now, and after multiple failed attempts at finding him, the local authorities had called in the big guns. Little did I know that this mission would turn into something much darker. My team and I had set up camp along a creek bank, the last known location of the missing hiker. We didn't expect anything out of the ordinary at first, considering we were dealing with a run-of-the-mill search and rescue operation. To pass the time before deployment the next morning, we exchanged stories and laughed at each other's stupid jokes. The next day, we fanned out and explored different sections of the forest in search of any sign of life or evidence related to the disappearance. It was slow going at first. The dense foliage and shadows cast by the tall trees made every movement around us seem suspicious. Some members of my team reported finding shredded clothing and old campfires, but nothing concrete. Our search took an unexpected turn when we stumbled upon a small clearing littered with grisly remains. The chilling sight was horrifying, blood-stained clothes from previous victims, some with chunks of flesh still attached. Entrails were strung up between branches like twisted party decorations. Chills ran down my spine as I examined these gruesome discoveries. Jack! Check this out! yelled Mike from across the clearing. He held up what appeared to be someone's torn-off scalp, still clinging to long strands of hair. I approached cautiously but couldn't shake off an overwhelming sense of dread, convinced that we were being watched from somewhere in the shadows. Despite our highly trained elite status, vulnerability sank in its claws, and we all felt it. 
Then, out of nowhere, a blood-curdling scream echoed through the forest. We instinctively dropped to our knees, drawing our firearms and scanning our surroundings. The attacker was close. We just didn't know from where it would strike. Guys! It's Scott Jones! cried out Dave, one of my teammates, as he pointed towards the corpse-like figure hovering above him. Jones struggled feebly in the clutches of this thing that looked straight out of a nightmare. The creature stood nearly seven feet tall, with elongated limbs and massive hands tipped with razor-like claws. Its skin appeared pale and rotten, with pus oozing from open sores. Its eyes were beady black, boring into Jones like twin drills as its fang moss snarled menacingly. Our fight-or-flight instincts kicked in. Just shoot the damn thing! Screamed Dave as he opened fire at the beast while maintaining a safe distance. Bullets ripped into its pale flesh but seemed to do little as it shot up into the canopy, taking Jones with it. Our blood pounded in our ears, adrenaline coursing through us like wildfire. We knew we were dealing with something far beyond our understanding or control. Jack, what the hell is going on? What? What was that thing? Stammered Mike through his shock. I don't know, I admitted bitterly. But if there's a chance Jones is still alive, we have to find him and take that thing down. We regrouped and treaded cautiously deeper into the woods around us eyes darting to every flicker of movement, and ears pricked for any sound out of the ordinary, gripping our guns tighter than ever before. Somehow or another, we had stumbled upon an evil native to this densely wooded area. As we made our way through the underbrush and embraced the descent of dusk around us, I couldn't shake the creeping sensation that this creature, with its unmatched strength and brutality, had won at its home turf advantage. As the darkness grew around us, we knew that time was running out. We followed the faint sound of Jones's pained groans to a side trail leading to a small cave tucked behind some boulders. Slowly and carefully, we moved closer, guns drawn, ready for anything. The creature had laid Jones down near the mouth of the cave, treating him like some sort of prized catch. He was barely conscious, breathing heavily, his body covered in deep gashes inflicted by those monstrous claws. Help me, please, he whispered as we approached him. We've got you, buddy, Mike assured him, looking at me with determination in his eyes. I quickly surveyed the area, trying to find any sign of the creature before turning my attention back to Jones. That thing, it, it spoke. Jones muttered weakly between pain breaths. What? Are you sure? I stared at him intently as he struggled to keep his eyes open. It called itself the Wraith. He whispered before falling unconscious again. This information sent shockwaves through my core. I recalled old stories passed down among locals about a vengeful forest spirit they called the Wraith. It was said to have once been a Native American shaman who made a forbidden pact with dark forces from beyond our realm, seeking revenge for the destruction caused by settlers on their sacred land. The stories mentioned how the Wraith would abduct those who trespassed on these lands and punish them with excruciating pain and death as revenge for their sins against its people. Armed with this new lead on the antagonist's identity, we made a plan to take it down. We knew that it was a supernatural being capable of inflicting enormous pain but not invulnerable. The bullets from our firearms had hurt it. We just needed something stronger, something that exploited its connection to dark forces. I decided to initiate a sacred ritual, one that would cleanse the wraith of its dark powers and render it weak. Recalling my time serving in the Middle East, I remembered learning about exorcism and how powerful religious symbols could repel dark entities. 
Hoping it would work on the wraith, I asked the team to carve makeshift crosses out of the wood and wear them as a form of protection. In a matter of hours, we'd created a circle of fire around us to execute the exorcism. As the flames burned, I chanted ancient incantations that would force the wraith to confront its past and relinquish its dark powers. And then it happened. The creature emerged from the shadows, enraged by our efforts to undermine its strength. It charged at us in an animalistic rage, unfazed by our makeshift crosses but visibly weakened as the ritual took effect. We fired at it repeatedly, hitting it with every round until it faltered and fell to its knees. We approached cautiously, guns still drawn, as I continued reciting incantations aimed at driving away any lingering dark energy. The wraith stared up at me with despair in its eyes as they transformed from pitch black to human-like blue filled with profound sadness. Thank you. My soul is finally free. It whispered before collapsing in on itself and dissipating into thin air. We were left standing there in disbelief as we realized we'd destroyed the very essence of the wraith, freeing an ancient shaman's soul from its torment. Exhausted yet triumphant, we carried a wounded Jones back through the forest and emerged into daylight. Our harrowing journey in the depths of those haunted woods only strengthened our bond as a team. We promised to never forget our encounter with the wraith or the time we conquered an ancient darkness together. My name is Milo Maccabee, and I've been an exterminator for a good decade now. I never had a conventional 9-to-5 office job. Instead, I preferred getting down and dirty, ridding the world of creepy crawlies. What can I say? Unpopular jobs suit unpopular names. One balmy Tuesday afternoon in June... I got a call about a pest problem at an old house located outside of Providence, Rhode Island. The homeowner complained about strange noises and peculiar smells seeping through the walls. Plagued by gusts of uneasy sensations and chills running through their bodies, they believed it was a creature that needed dealing with, so I was the guy they called. As I approached the site, Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary from the outside, but then again, appearances could be deceiving. With my equipment in tow, I gave the doorbell a chime and was greeted by a middle-aged man who looked quite unnerved. "'Ah, you must be the exterminator,' he said with relief in his voice. "'Thank you for coming on such short notice.' "'Sure thing,' I replied cheerfully." What seems to be the problem? Inside the house, I began doing my routine check for signs of infestation while making jokes about exterminators sniffing out pests like bloodhounds. Suddenly, out of nowhere, there was a crashing noise from upstairs. The homeowner and I exchanged alarmed glances. What was that? He stammered as we both began climbing the stairs cautiously. The most peculiar sight awaited me on the second floor, shattered glass everywhere, and a distinct smell of rotting meat assaulted my senses. Upon investigation, remnants of an oversized rat or mouse hung from one of the open glass shards, but it wasn't normal. Strange, I muttered as we drew closer to examine it. As our eyes scanned over the shredded remains, we both jumped at the sound of another crash. Rushing into the next room, we stared in shock at something so bizarre and horrifying that I struggled to find words. A grotesque creature resembling a rat but with razor-like claws, sharp, gnashing teeth, and deadened black eyes. It hissed and twirled something inconsequential but grisly in its grip. 
An intense sense of fear washed over me as its white-rimmed eyes locked onto mine before it darted swiftly under the bed. My gaze shifted to the startled man beside me, exchanging thoughts on what we had witnessed. We need to find this thing before it disappears and does more harm, he exclaimed, his voice halting with panic. Grabbing my extermination tools firmly, I hesitantly agreed. Whatever that thing is, I said grimly, it doesn't belong here. Treading warily through the house, we searched desperately for any sign of that monstrous creature but found nothing. The smell so powerful before now seemed to have dissipated. With a sense of urgency, I decided to call the police for assistance. The homeowner agreed, realizing that this situation was beyond our capabilities. As we anxiously awaited their arrival, I tried to gather as much information as possible from the homeowner about his experiences with the creature. He mentioned a local historian who had once visited his home, discussing the property's extensive history and some bizarre incidents that occurred there in the past. When the police arrived, we showed them the damage caused by the creature and insisted that they listen to our surreal testimony. Some officers were visibly skeptical but agreed to help us search for any signs of the unusual antagonist. Despite our collective efforts combing every inch of the house, we failed to find any trace of this grotesque rat-like predator. Frustrated and fearful, I decided to visit the local historian mentioned by the homeowner. Upon explaining my encounter with this inexplicable creature, the historian confirmed my fears concerning its existence. The ominous creature went by many names in local legends, but one that seemed most relevant was Crethar. According to ancient lore, Crethar was a malevolent entity known for spreading disease and terrorizing unsuspecting victims. Returning home, I spent sleepless nights researching Crethar, trying to uncover its origin and motives for tormenting people. Each passing moment fueled my determination to eradicate this monstrous being before it claimed more lives and shattered more peace. It wasn't long before news spread throughout Providence of other grisly incidents involving a similar mysterious creature. People reported not animal remains in their homes or peculiar smells, making them feel uneasy. Police were baffled. There was no denying that something strange and dangerous was stalking our town. Deciding it was time for action, I tracked down Crethar's gruesome trail and enlisted help from trusted colleagues in my extermination business, which specializes in peculiar pests. Armed with custom-modified extermination tools designed to capture but not kill the creature, we devised a plan to corner and apprehend Crethar. A new surge of terror washed over Providence as the day arrived, the impeccable preparations filled with uncertain outcomes. With police forces involved in our plan, we staged locations in various parts of town for Crethar to be attracted to and inevitably spring our trap. As dusk fell and night cast its chilling veil, each team took position at their designated location. Our relentless pursuit unfolded with sickening events. Crethar's gory attacks left a trail of pain and devastation. We progressively closed in on the beast, chasing it from one spot to another. Our ultimate confrontation happened at an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Cornered by our knowledgeable team and officers, Crethar hissed and snarled menacingly sensing that his reign was nearing its end. One brave police officer managed to trap Crethar beneath a thick net despite sustaining severe injuries from its razor-like claws. But much to our collective horror, within seconds, the creature's grotesque body began dissolving into an oozing black mass before disappearing entirely, leaving nothing behind but putrid fumes that singed our senses. 
In the aftermath of this appalling episode, we concluded that Krithar could not be captured nor killed. Its mysterious existence was something no mortal being could comprehend. Yet its disappearance left behind an eerie silence in the town, the remaining horrifying memories causing grim furrows on the brows. The only consolation derived from our battle with Krithar was limiting its damages and possibly preventing further chaos. For now. Providence may continue walking on eggshells, knowing that such a malevolent force might someday return or shift elsewhere to sow more despair and affliction. While I returned to my profession as an exterminator, a constant sense of unease would forever accompany me, knowing too well about this extraordinarily sinister creature lurking somewhere unknown. And even though Krithar's dreadful aura remained a looming presence, I couldn't help but feel satisfied that we had not just survived but persevered against such unique terror. This experience would become part of the legacy I leave behind, a chilling tale of enduring darkness and the unparalleled resilience of those who refuse to surrender. As I continue my work as an exterminator, that peeved part inside hoped never to encounter Krithar again. Yet another, more courageous fragment sought it out, for there was always unfinished business to attend to in this unending battle between good and evil. I remember pressing the last of my drowsiness out of my eyes as I reached for my morning coffee, muttering something about needing to find a better brand. As a CIA agent, my life was a constant flow of classified missions and life-or-death situations, which made those little moments of normalcy that much more vital. With this particular mission inching closer to the horizon, I tried not to think about the daunting task ahead. As I stepped out of my apartment, I glanced at the headline on a tattered newspaper. Chaos continues in Alabama. With whispers growing louder regarding the increasing number of missing people in a small Alabama town called Waterville, locating those responsible had become my latest priority. Typically, our agency wouldn't get involved in these types of cases, but local law enforcement was at its wit's end, creating enough noise in the media for our superiors to take notice. Arriving at Waterville several days later, I met with some concerned relatives of the missing persons, those who were desperately searching for answers and closure. Their faces were etched with exhaustion and grief. We sat together in an old diner, stale coffee and anxiety permeating the air, as they recounted their last interactions with their loved ones. Somebody must have kidnapped them, whispered one woman through her sobs. I just snatched them from their homes, added another man with a shiver. The local residents all told eerily similar stories. It was never safe to step outside after dark. Scratching noises filled moonlit nights. Fear reigned supreme in Waterville. As I investigated further, one name kept resurfacing among murmurs, the Revenant. Passed down through generations in Waterville folklore as an omen of doom and discord, this creature allegedly stalked the town's shadows. While the tales differed somewhat about it being a tall, hideous man or an entity that took on various forms, all accounts agreed that those caught in its grasp vanished without a trace. Logic dictated there had to be something more concrete, some human connection, responsible for these abductions. I tried to push the unsettling feeling out of my mind as nightfall approached. Time was unforgiving as I searched for any clues, each dark corner holding an unspoken terror. One moonlit night, as I quietly patrolled the outskirts of Waterville, a faint scream split the still air. Following the sound, I found myself at the town's cemetery, 
where I stumbled upon what had to be an improvised torture chamber. Everywhere I looked, mangled bodies and viscera painted a macabre picture that would haunt me forever. At that moment, my worst fears were confirmed. The Revenant wasn't simply folklore. It was horrifyingly real. Panic surged within me as I stumbled back out into the fresh air and called my team for backup. It was then that it arrived, silent and slithering somewhere in the shadows of tombstones. All that we'd been told was true, vile beyond belief. It was unnatural with elongated limbs and an impossibly misshapen form. As I tried to comprehend the grotesque apparition, transfixed by terror, it lunged toward me with an inhuman speed. As its twisted silhouette loomed over me, ready to strike, adrenaline surged through my veins as instinct took over. I'd barely had time to react before I spun around and sprinted towards the cemetery's gates, my survival instincts propelling me forward. The Revenant pursued us, its twisted limbs stretching and contorting as it closed the distance between us. Between gasps for air, I called for assistance on my radio. My voice was shaky and weak, but I managed to convey my location and the urgency of the situation. My colleagues arrived in record time, weapons drawn, ready to confront the unspeakable horror that chased me. The Revenant was relentless in its pursuit, leaving a trail of mutilated victims in its wake. But even as bullets tore through its unnatural body, it seemed unscathed, evidently immune to our attacks. The scattered team members glanced at each other in terror as they rapidly fired off shots that proved futile. As our resources depleted, we retreated into a nearby abandoned building for a brief moment of respite from the relentless chase. One agent mentioned an old book about local folklore he found at the town library earlier that day. It detailed peculiar incidents throughout Waterville's history linked to an insidious entity known as the Revenant. The book provided chilling descriptions of a grotesque figure hunting unsuspecting villagers under the cover of darkness, much like what we were experiencing today. Our greatest asset had undoubtedly become the townspeople's collective stories. They offered important clues about this sinister creature. During our frantic escape, we overheard a hushed conversation between two locals who claimed their ancestors tried in vain to defeat the Revenant several generations ago. They whispered about using fire against it, and that no one dared speak its name for fear it would put them on its list of victims. Suddenly piecing things together, we concluded our only hope was to lure the Revenant into some sort of trap involving fire. After all, every creature has some vulnerability. The plan had to be executed perfectly, or we risked joining the eerie collection of victims we'd discovered earlier. We hastily constructed a trap around a massive bonfire in the town center, hoping our intuition proved fruitful. As night fell once more, agents took positions around the pyre. The Revenant appeared, drawn from its hiding place by the imposing flames. It was now or never. With military precision, the agents closed in on it, pushing the creature towards the roaring fire. Tendrils of smoke and flame licked their way up its twisted form with a hiss, and it writhed in pain, revealing its weakness at last. The Revenant shrieked an ear-piercing wail before retreating into the depths of Waterville's woods, leaving a lingering sense of dread that would not fade easily. Our encounter had wounded it, but not fatally. With our mission somewhat accomplished and with hope for further research to uncover additional vulnerabilities in this terrifying being, we prepared to return home. I shared one last glance with my fellow agents as I entered my vehicle, knowing no words could encapsulate our harrowing journey together for the past few days. As I drove away from Waterville in growing darkness, 
I couldn't shake a terrible premonition that somehow our efforts only served to anger and embolden the revenant. The creature's sinister presence had hung over the town for generations. After tonight's events, who knew when, or where, it would strike again. I must search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, currently stationed in the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. This region is known for its unpredictable weather and rough terrain, which keeps me on my toes. I've always seen myself as a practical person, not the type to believe in supernatural stories or spooky legends. Yet, what I experienced one humid summer afternoon shook me to my core. Noticing something unusual on one of our security cameras, my supervisor asked me to investigate why the woodland creatures were avoiding a particular area in the forest that they usually frequent. The footage perplexed me as well, prompting me to grab my jacket and head out to get a closer look at what might be going on. The hike through the loamy soil was surprisingly serene, as sunlight filtered through branches overhead and colorful wildflowers bloomed along the slim path. Chirping birds, buzzing insects, and rustling foliage provided a soothing soundtrack while I trekked deeper into the thick vegetation. As I approached the specified area, though, I noticed an ominous silence enveloping my surroundings. The cheerful songbirds seemed to have vanished entirely, and even the wind seemed wary of passing through this pocket of land. My hair stood on end as a guttural growl echoed through the eerie stillness. I quickened my pace while reaching for my walkie-talkie to report back, but all I heard through the static were whispers in unknown tongues. Curiosity urged me forward despite a chill creeping up my spine. With every step closer to that sinister void where nature's beautiful symphony ceased to play, my heartbeat pounded in anticipation or fear. A figure suddenly lunged at me from the shadows without warning. Its horrifying visage sent chills down my spine, massive talons protruded from its long fingers, and sharp fangs glinted menacingly in its cavernous mouth. It looked like something straight out of a nightmare, a creature born from twisted folklore. A fellow officer hurriedly appeared, gun already drawn and began firing at the abomination before us. The nightmarish creature howled in rage, emanating a bone-chilling guttural sound that tore through the air. I couldn't fathom what kind of beast we were facing, but we couldn't afford to let it escape and continue tormenting the forest. A gruesome battle ensued, with the two of us pitted against the terrifying monstrosity. Despite sustaining deep gashes from its wicked claws, we continued our valiant struggle not just to survive but also to protect others from falling victim to this grotesque fiend. But as I lunged at the creature, attempting to drive my knife through its thick hide, my fellow officer and I found ourselves in a desperate fight for our lives. The abomination's relentless assault continued, leaving us struggling to fend off the deadly blows from its violent appendages. Don't give up! We can't let this thing win! My fellow officer yelled, breathless from the exertion. We pressed on, our energy drained by the seemingly invincible creature. It was then that another figure emerged from the tree lean, clutching a strange, ancient-looking tome. The figure was clad in tattered and mud-streaked robes, their hood concealing their identity. They began to chant unfamiliar words as they stood at a distance from the chaotic battle. To our astonishment and relief, the mysterious figure's chanting appeared to have an effect on the fearsome beast. It staggered backward, momentarily ceasing its brutal attack. We seized this opportunity to catch our breath, and regained some semblance of strength. 
The chanting grew more intense as the figure tightened their grip on the tome. Lightning struck just beside us, illuminating our surroundings for an instant. In that fleeting moment of clarity, we noticed that the creature had begun to weaken significantly, its once mighty form becoming frail before our eyes. As the storm raged around us, desperation grew within our monstrous adversary. With one last furious swipe of its talons, it caught my fellow officer off guard and brought him down with a heart-wrenching scream. No! I cried out in horror. But before I could do anything to help him, I found myself pinned against a tree trunk by one of the creature's massive claws. The chant reached a feverish crescendo as lightning continued to crash around us. The savage creature twitched violently before finally collapsing to the ground in defeat. Its hideous form began to dissolve into a blackened sludge as it emitted otherworldly wails of anguish. I felt the pressure release from my chest, and I stumbled away from the tree, gasping for air. The hooded figure approached me slowly, their eyes momentarily visible beneath the shadows of their hood. They were filled with sorrow and sympathy. You have survived, they said softly, but your friend is gone. I looked over at my fallen comrade, tears streaming down my face. The figure placed a hand on my shoulder. The creature was once human, an unsuspecting man named Daniel whose soul became consumed by ancient evil. They explained, I am sorry for what you have endured and for the loss of your fellow officer. My duty was to stop this abomination after it fed off the innocent life in these woods. As the rain poured down around us, mixing with my tears of grief and exhaustion, I looked at the figure and managed to croak out a question. Who are you? I am only here to protect humanity from unspeakable evils. They said solemnly as they pulled back their hood, revealing an aged but otherwise unremarkable face. My name is Amelia. With that, Amelia vanished into the relentless storm and darkness that surrounded us, her work now complete. I wearily made my way back to our station with a heavy heart, the echoes of battle and horror still ringing in my ears. Although I reported my encounters with the terrifying Daniel Turn creature as honestly as possible, most dismissed it as mere folklore. However, those who have experienced similar encounters within the untamed forest remain steadfast in their belief in Amelia's existence and her eternal fight against insidious darkness. Would our paths ever cross again? The thought lingered in my mind as I continued to persevere through new challenges as a search and rescue officer, heedful of, yet never truly prepared for, whatever might await me in those timeless woods. It was an average shift at the Mysterium Museum where I, Dexter Kowalski, worked as a dedicated night guard. Nobody ever knew the place even existed, tucked away in a quiet corner of Buffalo, New York. This museum housed oddities and artifacts that had sent many patrons fleeing in disgust. It's rumored that some of these artifacts possess an unnatural aura. I never believed in all that supernatural mumbo-jumbo, but I couldn't deny the creepy atmosphere around this place. Particularly when I found myself walking the dark and narrow hallways alone after closing time. But hey, a steady paycheck and some top-notch security perks, like access to a loaded stun gun, meant no complaints from me. As I strolled past displays of shrunken heads and disturbing torture devices of centuries long gone, I heard something that nearly made me jump out of my skin, a sickening crunch echoing from deep within the museum. Breathing through panicked gasps, I told myself not to freak out. After all, 
It could just be an animal, or maybe a faulty pipe. Nothing unusual for this old building. Curiosity getting the better of me, I cautiously approached the area where the sound had come from. Every step brought a stab of regret at leaving my cozy security booth behind, with each floorboard creaking relentlessly under my boots. Soon enough, I found myself standing in front of one of our strangest exhibits yet, a misshapen and weathered coffin dug up from an unmarked grave in an ancient European cemetery. The lid had been cracked open ever so slightly, as if someone, or something, had been trying to escape its eternal prison. The air suddenly grew thick with dread as agonizing moans filled the room. My heart threatened to lash out from my chest, but instead of retreating like any sane person would do, I foolishly moved closer to the trembling casket. What I saw inside made my blood run cold. The man, or what used to be a man, had been transformed into an unspeakable horror with barely human features. It was now more monster than man, its limbs twisted and shrunken. Slimy tendrils spurted from what remained of its face, weaving together in a grotesque imitation of human facial muscles. Giving in to terror, I tried to back away when those soulless eyes locked onto mine, and the creature lunged at me with blinding speed. Its serrated teeth gnashed mere inches from my neck, and I barely managed to dodge its gruesome maw in the nick of time. Adrenaline pumping through my veins, I scrambled for my stun gun and aimed it directly at the horrifying creature. But the weapon had little effect on the monstrous deformity. If anything, it only seemed more irate, hungrier, even. Now running for dear life down the once familiar corridors of the museum, I reached out desperately with shaky hands for my walkie-talkie while sprinting away from the enraged fiend chasing me. Be back up! And need back up! There's something, something in the museum. I choked out to whoever was on duty at the security headquarters that night. I could feel myself losing this deadly race against time as my legs began to buckle from exhaustion. The grotesque snarls of that unspeakable creature grew louder, closer, until it was right on my heels, each desperate step fraught with unbearable torment. I bolted through the museum, its eerie silence interrupted only by the monster's inhuman screeches and my own frantic footsteps. I fumbled to unlock the exit door, finally flinging it wide open as I sprinted out into the night. Once outside, I sprinted toward the nearest store with its lights still on. Bursting into the small convenience store, I shouted for anyone to call the police. Three startled customers stared at me with wide eyes as the shopkeeper quickly dialed 911. The police arrived within minutes, their sirens wailing as they skidded to a halt in front of the museum. Officers swarmed in and began combing the building, searching for any sign of the creature that had nearly ended my life. The search proved futile, as they found no trace of it. They did find, however, several torn-apart corpses of fellow security guards and museum employees who hadn't managed to escape its deadly clutches. As we gathered outside, one officer turned to me with a grim look on his face. We need to know what we're dealing with here, he said solemnly. What can you tell us about this thing? An elderly woman who had been working late on a restoration project chimed in. It sounds like Grendel from Beowulf, she said nervously. Grendel was a hideous monster who attacked at night and killed without mercy. The mention of Grendel sparked a memory for me. One of our recent exhibits was centered around ancient literature, and Beowulf was indeed part of that collection. As I hesitantly shared this information with the officers and staff gathered around me, we came to a chilling realization together. 
The monstrous creature roaming our museum was one of those ancient terrors brought to life. As night turned into day and then returned to night once again, officers continued to search for the bloodthirsty creature. However, despite securing the perimeter and having the entire building under surveillance, they never laid eyes on Grendel. At each turning of the night, more brutal murders occurred in town. The people were panicked, demanding answers from authorities as their fear grew exponentially. But with no reliable leads to go on, both law enforcement officials and citizens alike grasped at straws. Eventually, it was decided that I needed protection from the monster since I was barely able to escape its gruesome grasp. An officer arrived at my residence every night to ensure my safety. After a week of terror and sleepless nights in town, it seemed as if Grendel had simply vanished into thin air. The killings stopped as suddenly as they had begun, and despite our relentless search efforts to capture it, there was no sign of the gory beast. As life began to regain some semblance of normalcy for most of us in Buffalo, we still questioned what had transpired over those horrendous few days. How could something so deadly and horrifying simply disappear? What would become of our once quiet town if Grendel were to return? For me personally, venturing back to my job at the Mysterium Museum proved nearly impossible. Every unexplained sound sent shockwaves through my body as I tried to steady my quaking nerves. I eventually resigned myself to accepting that museum security was simply not the right line of work for me. For weeks afterward, though life returned to normal in Buffalo, everyone lived with an unspoken dread that Grendel might one day reappear. My heart ached for those we lost to its savagery as we kept their memory alive within our mourning community. To this day, no one knows what happened to Grendel after its deadly spree of violence. Some claim that it moved on to another unsuspecting town, while others whisper that it is merely hiding, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike again. Every night, as I lay my head down to sleep, the unidentifiable creature with tendrils and twisted limbs haunting the museum still terrifies me. I try to tell myself that the nightmare has ended, but deep inside, a voice nags me, insisting that this is only the beginning, that it's just a matter of time before Grendel makes its inevitable return. Life has always been a series of revelations for me. For instance, I never knew I had an inexplicable fear of silence until that fateful evening. I'm Daniel Thompson, alias Dorati. Nobody calls me that. I just thought it sounded cool. That evening, as I was driving home from work, I realized the radio wasn't working in my 2002 Camry, the pinnacle of average when it comes to cars. Ugh, thanks, Murphy! I sarcastically yelled to the sky, referring to Murphy's Law, and instantly regretted the sunroof. Now, when things go wrong, I'll just blast some good old Metallica from my phone speakers. Effective coping mechanism? Still debatable. My drive through West Mifflin, Pennsylvania, was dreary and mundane. Not too many people were out. While stopped at a red light, my windows fogged up from the chilly autumn air surrounding the car. It had been a long day of number crunching and downtrodden humor. I needed sustenance. The light turned green just as I decided on pizza takeout for dinner. As soon as I pulled over outside Frankie's Pizzeria, known for their Philly cheesesteak pizza, I got lost in thoughts about devouring it. And then there was this knock. Out of nowhere, or so it seems, were two kids with their faces hidden behind hoodies. Yo! The taller one peered into my window. 
Can you, like, help us find our puppy? I chuckled at the unexpected request. You ever hear of the great Dara? Sorry, Daniel Thompson? Then more seriously. I can call someone for you if you'd like. Nah, said the smaller one instantly. The first thing that struck me was how unsettlingly confident they sounded for their age. All right, then. Feeling defeated in my heroic ambitions, I excused myself and went into the pizzeria, still debating whether or not they were a fragment of my imagination. Within minutes, I was out again with my dinner in hand. To my surprise, the two kids still stood there. As I walked to the car, I could see their eyes, eerie black voids that stared straight into my soul. Involuntarily shuddering, I muttered, Come on, Daniel! Time to eat your weight in cheese! I reached my apartment complex as the fear began to creep in. What was it about those kids? Were they human? Surely not. But if not, who or what were they? Just as I started settling into my comically unhealthy meal, my phone rang. It was Karen from work, a chain of bad jokes personified. Daniel! Karen exclaimed breathlessly. You're not going to believe this. Those kids, those black-eyed things, you saw them too? My heart dropped. This was all becoming too real too quickly. What the hell were those kids? And why were they haunting me and Karen? We decided to commiserate over our strange encounter and devise a plan for how to address this nightmarish predicament when we suddenly heard commotion outside Karen's house. We have to see if others see them, she blurted out. We went door to door, trying to find answers or help but one already boarded up house stood out among the others. The door creaked open as we approached. There's something not right about this place, Karen whispered. I couldn't agree more, I replied nervously while trying to maintain some semblance of calm. As we stepped inside, the air seemed cold and oppressive, with an indistinguishable stench penetrating our nostrils. They had been here. We both knew it instantly. Suddenly, there was a deafening shriek, followed by the sound of something being viciously torn apart. Guttural, inhuman growls filled the air as we saw a grotesque sight that we never could have anticipated. Chills rushed through my veins as we witnessed the gruesome nature of those black-eyed beings. Tearing ourselves from the harrowing scene, Karen and I stumbled backward, our hearts pounding. We had to warn others. We had to try and stop these horrifying creatures. We dashed out of the house, gulping fresh air, trying to dispel the pungent smell lingering in our nostrils. Panic seized us, but we needed to act rationally. Calling for help was out of the question. No one would believe us. Instead, we knocked on doors and spoke to frightened neighbors who'd heard the chilling sounds coming from that house. One elderly man seemed unsurprised by our tale. Those black-eyed children, they've been a local legend for years, he told us solemnly. They feed on fear and pain. His words urged us on as we gathered a few brave souls willing to confront these menacing beings before more individuals fell prey. After reviewing what little knowledge we had about the black-eyed children's abilities and behaviors, we came up with a rough plan, one that included trapping them in a space where they couldn't escape or do more harm. Using walkie-talkies for communication, our small group split up, determined to locate the two terrorists. It wasn't long before Karen's shaky voice crackled through my receiver. I found them. With my heart racing, I converged at her location with the rest of the group. There they were, those sinister siblings, back against one of their empty hideouts. In that moment of confrontation, 
it became clear how deeply rooted their power was in our abject terror. They stood there defiantly, their awful black eyes burning into each one of us. But together as a group, facing these abominations head-on, we found a modicum of strength. Surging toward them as one united force, we brandished makeshift weapons and began shouting with conviction born out of pure desperation. You're not welcome here. Leave and never come back. The children seemed stunned. We watched them writhe and twist under the pressure. Our collective will overpower them. Their disfigured forms altered before our very eyes, contorting unnaturally as they vanished into the ether. A tense silence filled the air. The nightmare appeared to be over, and slowly, our motley crew allowed themselves a moment to believe we had won. But something nags at me. The old man had mentioned that these creatures fed on fear and pain, yet I couldn't shake the dreadful feeling that this was only part of their sickening nourishment. Seeking out the elderly neighbor, I pressed him for more details on these monsters, their origins, their motives, and how they could be decisively stopped. A grim expression seized his features as he revealed their name and true purpose. Leviathra and Seraphis were ancient entities driven by sadistic chaos. They didn't merely feed on fear. They used it to infiltrate the minds of others, perpetuating a cycle of pain and destruction. We'd stop them this time, maybe, but not permanently. Despite our brazen confrontation, I knew deep down we'd merely postponed an agonizing certainty. The Athra and Seraphis would return. As we dispersed to our separate lives, changed forever by what we'd experienced, we privately committed ourselves to keeping watch for any sign of their hateful resurgence. In the weeks that followed, whispers persisted about black-eyed beings lurking in West Mifflin's shadows. Terrible rumors grew like twisted vines around that house on the hill but no tangible evidence surfaced to feed our darkest fears. Yet still we wait. My heart raced as I stumbled upon the strange package in my mailbox, wrapped in plain brown paper with no return address. I was just arriving home late after my job at a local deli, eager to relax and prepare for Halloween night. October had been an unusually quiet month in our small suburban neighborhood of Waterville, Maine, and my neighbors were excitedly setting up decorations while their children donned their costumes in preparation for trick-or-treating. Hey there, Clifford, called out Mr. Davidson from his yard where he was adjusting a skeleton prop hanging from a tree limb. Find anything interesting in the mail? Not sure yet, Mr. Davidson, I replied, clutching the mysterious package. I just got this odd-looking parcel. I gave an amused shrug. Well, be careful with those. Sometimes people like to play pranks this time of the year, he warned with a chuckle. I entered my house and tore open the package, revealing an old VHS tape labeled, Keep Safe. There was no note or any indication of who sent it or why it ended up in my hands. Initially skeptical about its contents, I decided to watch it out of sheer curiosity. As the video began to play on my old television set, a shaky camera captured the dark hallways and vacant rooms of what appeared to be an abandoned building situated close to our community park. My eyes widened as the camera focused on several horrifyingly mutilated bodies scattered all around, clearly in various stages of decomposition, all of them far too realistic to be simply props for a Halloween prank video. In one chilling moment, a draped figure appeared briefly on screen, their face obscured by a tattered hood and their eyes invisible behind the shadow cast over them, before vanishing into the darkness like a ghostly apparition. 
The tape abruptly cut off after that scene, leaving me unnerved and battling a cold sweat on my forehead. It suddenly crashed into me. The gruesome images recorded on the tape had to be someone's twisted Halloween prank. I convinced myself that it was just an elaborate hoax, albeit utterly disturbing, and decided to share the video with Mr. Davidson. Check this out, I said, skipping pleasantries as I barged into his house uninvited. Someone sent me this sick joke for Halloween. As we sat down to watch the video together, Mr. Davidson's wife, Isabel, joined us with their child, Caleb, who was begging to join us despite his mother's protests. I wondered if I should leave their house at once and call the police instead, but something compelled me to stay put. We watched in horrified fascination as the hooded figure reappeared on screen, a twisted grin barely visible behind the shadows. It wasn't until Caleb let out a high-pitched scream that we realized that time had completely stopped around us. We tried frantically to move but found ourselves frozen in place, unable to speak, our terror multiplying tenfold as we felt a sudden chilling presence behind us. A cold laugh echoed through the room as the hooded figure from the tape materialized before our eyes, flesh and blood, devoid of compassion or remorse. I managed to force my eyes shut as the malicious entity proceeded towards Caleb. No, cried Mr. Davidson in gut-wrenching agony, but none of our screams or pleas went unheard by the merciless villain now closing in on his prey. Our helplessness consumed us as we were paralyzed in perpetual terror, and all attempts to break free from this nightmare proved futile. No amount of strength or desperate prayers could reverse the grim fate that now hangs over our heads like a guillotine waiting to fall. In a desperate attempt to break free from our paralysis, I found myself trying to scream with all my might. Though my voice was barely audible, it seemed to momentarily weaken the hooded figure's grip on reality. Seizing the opportunity, Mr. Davidson was able to move an arm and reach for his phone. Still unable to speak, he punched in the emergency number with his trembling fingers and hoped against hope that the operator would understand the gravity of the situation. Caleb's cries grew louder, but the hooded figure hesitated for a moment, as if thrown off by our sudden movements. We were all unsure of what would happen next. Would this mysterious attacker simply vanish or strike back with unprecedented force? Miraculously, sirens echoed through the air as a team of police officers burst into the house. Startled by their sudden intrusion, the hooded figure seemed to lose focus, and we were able to regain control of our bodies. As Mr. Davidson desperately held on to his wife and child, I took it upon myself to tackle the hooded figure in an effort to subdue them before they could escape. Our struggle was intense, but it was clear that whoever hid behind that tattered hood had never engaged in any form of combat training. The police officers joined in, managing to restrain and handcuff the hooded individual while we caught our breaths and assessed our injuries, primarily psychological wounds yet nothing life-threatening. What's going on? Officer Roberts asked as he helped me stand up. We don't know, I admitted. We were just watching a creepy video someone sent me when this person appeared. The police removed the hoodie from the assailant's face only to reveal Mrs. Wilson from next door. The room fell silent in disbelief. How could such a kind and seemingly harmless woman be responsible for this twisted series of events? As she cackled maniacally despite her restrained state, several officers took her away, intending to question her further. In the meantime, the police examined the video and assured us that they would handle the situation. I thanked Mr. Davidson and his family for their help and returned home relieved that this nightmare had come to an end. But my curiosity about Mrs. Wilson's twisted intentions continued to haunt me. 
Days later, after spending hours being questioned and evaluated by professionals, Mrs. Wilson was revealed to be suffering from severe mental health issues. She had meticulously planned the whole ordeal as a desperate cry for attention and was now receiving the aid she clearly needed. In a bizarre twist of fate, our horrifying experience led to a severely sick person getting the help they so desperately required. We were simultaneously grateful for our survival and heartbroken by the reality of her suffering. As life slowly returned to normal, we could not help but look back on those harrowing events with a mixture of bewilderment and relief. Despite its gruesome nature, it was impossible not to feel a glimmer of hope as we considered the unexpected outcome. Our lives remained forever intertwined with that unfortunate night, serving as a constant reminder that sometimes in this unpredictable world, even the darkest moments can lead to a flicker of light, guiding damaged souls out of the abyss towards hope and healing. Life has a funny way of catching up to you, doesn't it? You think you've seen it all, and suddenly, the universe throws something new your way, something that makes you question everything you thought you knew. That's what happened to me during the Cherry Hill Festival in New Jersey. I worked as a small-town police officer. My name's Dan Wilder. The festival attracted people from all over the county with its food stands, carnival rides, and talent shows. The town was buzzing with excitement and laughter. My partner, Officer Virginia Scott, and I were assigned to patrol the area around the festival, where we intended to ensure everyone's safety. While on our routine patrol, we received a call about a disturbance on Maple Street one of the old residential areas in town. A neighbor reported hearing strange noises coming from one of the abandoned houses and decided to report it, fearing that some unruly teenagers might be vandalizing the place. As we arrived at the dilapidated house, shrouded in thick, overgrown bushes and trees, an eerie feeling enveloped us. However, we approached cautiously without alarming whoever might be inside. Hey, Dan, Virginia whispered as we made our way through the creaky front door. What did one wall say to the other? What? I asked, confused by her odd question. Meet me at the corner. She chuckled quietly. I shook my head but smiled, appreciating her attempt at lightening the mood. Inside the house, it was pitch black except for faint moonlight filtering through broken windows. The air was heavy with dust and decay, creating discomfort in breathing. As we ventured deeper into the house using our flashlights to illuminate our path, we heard thumping continuously above us, slowly increasing in intensity. Hurrying towards those sounds cautiously up a flight of rickety stairs, screeching with every step, making us wince. We found ourselves facing a closed door that looked out of place compared to the rest of the house, almost as if it had been recently installed. As Virginia carefully opened the door, we were stunned by what awaited us. The room was full of mutilated dolls and scraps of clothing scattered across the floor, surrounding a wall filled with deranged-looking scratches. In a far corner, there was something crouching, twitching, and making guttural noises. A human-animal hybrid figure covered in tattered clothes, its face distorted and unrecognizable, was gnawing on a doll with teeth that resembled sharpened nails. Virginia and I stared in horror, unable to comprehend the monstrosity sitting in front of us. Suddenly, it snapped its grotesque head up to look at us, pausing for a moment before it let out a blood-curdling screech and launched at us with sharp claws extended. Acting on reflex, 
I pushed Virginia out of harm's way before feeling those razor-like claws swipe across my chest. Intense pain seared through me as I fell to the ground, gasping for breath. Virginia pulled me back onto my feet while our monstrous attacker pursued me relentlessly. We stumbled back down the stairs while our radios crackled with static. Fear laced through my voice as I called for backup but received only garbled responses that sounded vaguely like distant screams. Is there another way out? I croaked to Virginia as we half ran, half stumbled through the dark corridors. Back door! She replied breathlessly as we struggled to keep ahead of the abomination chasing us. With ragged breaths and blood soaking through my uniform, salvation came into view, the back door leading towards an overgrown garden forgotten by time. We finally threw open the back door and stumbled into the garden. Virginia slammed it shut behind us, and without wasting a moment, we retraced our steps through the tangled greenery back to our patrol car. As we hurriedly unlocked it and scrambled inside, the abomination inside the house burst through the wooden door, splintering it in its furious pursuit. I fumbled with the keys and managed to start the engine just as the creature leaped onto the car, shattering the front windshield with its tremendous force. It clawed its way inside, snapping its grotesque teeth inches away from us. We have to call for help! I shouted over its guttural growls. Virginia blinked but didn't move. She was paralyzed with fear from seeing such a vicious scene unfold right before our eyes. Summoning my remaining strength, I reached over to her and pressed the patrol car's radio button. Although riskier since our calls were broadcast to all units, it was our best chance for help. I could only hope someone would hear us properly. All units, this is Officer Wilder. We need immediate backup at Maple Street. We're under attack. I yelled into the radio despite not knowing if backup would even arrive on time or meet a tragic fate at the hands of this brutal monster. The creature screeched furiously as it barely missed, sinking its sharp claws into my face. Virginia managed to recover from her bout of paralysis and started striking at it with her baton in an attempt to buy some time. The aggressive blows Virginia dealt against the creature managed to briefly distract it. I reversed rapidly out of the driveway before speeding down the road toward town. We heaved a short sigh of relief as we put some distance between ourselves and whatever that thing was, but we knew there wasn't much time. When backup arrived on Maple Street minutes later, there wasn't any trace of our adversary apart from the mangled wooden remnants of doors and windows. What truly unnerved us, though, was the absence of evidence. No blood, no fur and no tangible leads that could tell us what we had just faced. An older officer with years of experience serving the town had overheard our distress call and came to assist. He pulled me aside from the crowd of bewildered colleagues and pulled out a book that looked like it had seen better days. I think you might want to hear about something that's been part of local folklore for generations. It fits the description of what you've encountered, he said gravely before sharing the deadly tale about the creature named Old Grimeye. Old Grimeye was a mythical creature that had terrorized several towns for decades. The residents described it as an uncanny mix between a human and a wild beast with an ungodly appetite for flesh. Its presence has since become an undesirable urban legend whispered in hushed tones as they are swallowed by fear at the mere thought of encountering such unworldly horror. Truth be told, I didn't fully believe the officer's story, at least not until now. That chilling encounter forced me to reevaluate everything I thought was impossible or implausible. Over time, we tried our best to search for old Grimeye, 
but he always seemed one step behind. Unable to capture or kill it, we were left with endless questions and mounting dread about what could happen next. More grotesque attacks continued in unsuspecting towns over those few days. Each victim left carefully placed in an abandoned home reeking of sorrow and death. An inexplicable coldness would sweep through those towns, causing roads to ice over despite the weather report insisting on warmer conditions. The authorities never managed to officially attribute these macabre events to Old Grim Eye or any other plausible suspects. Sleepless nights floated away like time, whether I liked it or not. Soon, the sightings stopped and our fears started to recede. They say there's a pattern to this monster's appearances, but if that's true, that means Old Grim Eye could well return one day. And what terrifying new encounters will come with its arrival? This all began when I realized that cheese puffs and beer don't make the best dinner combo. Sure, they taste great at the time, but the heartburn afterward isn't worth it. Anyway... My name is Jed Harthorn, a simple farmer making a living here in Sinton, Texas. It's not the fanciest place on earth, but it's got this warm familiarity to it that keeps me rooted. But as it turned out, this little cozy town harbored something sinister. One day I was just working away at my farm when I heard some strange noises coming from an old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Now, I'm no busybody. I usually couldn't give two hoots about what's happening around town. But let me tell you, nobody fills their britches faster than old Jed when things sound unnatural. I cautiously went over to investigate, knowing human curiosity has always been man's Achilles heel, and mine was tugging on me like a dog wanting a walk. As I approached the area... I noticed odd scratch marks all over the building. These definitely weren't left by anything human. Suddenly, I heard yells from inside. Hesitantly peeking through a crack in the warehouse door, I saw my neighbor Fred desperately trying to defend himself against something unfathomable. A creature neither bird nor reptile, but rather an inexplicable blend that seemed more at home in a pulp horror comic than rural Texas. It had sharp claws and an unusually long tongue that slashed through the air like a whip. Jed! Help! Fred screamed as blood trickled from his numerous wounds caused by that thing attacking him. I fumbled for my phone, intending to call for help, but who would believe this? No one would take me seriously until Fred was possibly gone, other than a hot enchilada during lambing season. Swallowing my fear, I took my hunting knife out of my pocket and tried to come up with a plan. The creature's attention was solely focused on Fred, so sneaking up behind it seemed like our best bet. Fred, I'm coming! Just hang in there! I shouted, darting into the warehouse. Fred looked both relieved and terrified, his face white as a ghost. My heart pounding, I crept closer to the monstrous being. Just as I was about to jump on it and plant my knife firmly in its back, the creature's avian head swiveled suddenly, and it locked its piercing gaze onto me with a sickening hiss that was physically nauseating. With lightning speed, the creature swung its barbed tail in my direction, forcing me to dive out of the way and causing debris to rain down all around me. Fred took advantage of the distraction and managed to scramble away from its clutches. Run! Get out of here! I yelled at him, hoping he'd have enough sense to do just that. Feeling a sharp, stinging sensation all over my body from the creature's acidic saliva that had splattered everywhere during its attack, I faced the thing head-on. It stalked toward me slowly, 
like a predator enjoying its inevitable victory, while I clenched my knife tighter and tighter, preparing myself for one last stand. The creature swung again, narrowly missing me by mere inches, as it took down beams around each side's heads, crashing down onto the warehouse floor. Dust filled our lungs as splinters of wood flew around us in a whirlwind of chaos. This felt like my last chance before it ended me once and for all. Seeing Fred finally escape, I felt a sense of relief. However, that fleeting moment of safety was quickly replaced with the grim realization that it was just me and the creature in the warehouse now. The creature screeched, filling the warehouse with a blood-curdling echo. As it charged towards me, I tried to dodge again but slipped on some debris from the previous impact. In perfect timing, my phone rang. It was a stroke of luck, as it attracted the creature's attention, giving me the opportunity to pick up my fallen knife and crawl backwards to safety. The unbearable pain from its acidic saliva was still tormenting me, but I couldn't afford to waste more time. I observed its movements, every shift and twitch, trying my best to calculate an optimal moment for retaliation. My knife felt heavy in my hand, but I knew it might be my only chance for survival. The creature charged again in a frenzy. As it lunged at me, I managed to slide aside at the very last moment and aim a strong slash at its tail. To my relief and horror, its tail fell off, a disgusting pile of writhing flesh on the floor. The creature screeched in pain, louder than before. It was agitated and more aggressive than ever. Fred burst into the warehouse after hearing my cries for assistance, followed by other town members, a third human party who had been searching for us all along after they'd seen suspicious tracks near my farm earlier that day. They were quick to inform me that they had been tracking this mythical being known as Nefertari, apparently an ancient hybrid creature predating our known history. At their arrival, Nefertari turned its cruel eye on them. Its intentions were as clear as day. But despite being outnumbered now by its newfound enemies, Nefertari showed no sign of fear or retreat. It was eager for bloodshed. Fred and the others tried to come up with a plan, but despite their best efforts, nothing worked. Nefertari continued to attack relentlessly. It wasn't long before many of them lay injured or unconscious on the floor from its unyielding assault. Abandoning the thought of defeat, I mustered the last bit of strength and threw my knife at its open maw in an attempt to stop it. To my disbelief, the knife lodged itself deep into Nefertari's throat, and for the first time in our horrendous encounter, it recoiled in pain. With wide eyes, we watched as Nefertari retreated back into one of the shadows in the warehouse. Just as quickly as it attacked, it vanished without a trace, leaving all of us to question what we just witnessed. Exhausted, we tended to our wounded selves and tried to make sense of the situation with little success or closure. Over the next few days, Fred and I gathered what little information we could about Nefertari through research, trying to piece together its motives for terrorizing our town, but we came up short. The more I learned about this deadly creature, the more I realized just how lucky we were to escape with our lives. While life carried on for the town's inhabitants with some semblance of normalcy, albeit never returning fully to what it once was, whispers of Nefertari still haunted the air. I couldn't shake off the feeling that Nefertari was somewhere out there watching us, nursing its wounds, and holding a grudge against those who sought to oppose it. The air around Sinton remained eerie and tense with that unsettling possibility. A lingering question mark regarding Nefertari's fate, which left us all glancing over our shoulders at shadows longer than comfortable. And so it remained, 
a dread-inducing suspense that settled into our lives like a chilling fog. And yet none of us could do anything about it but hope and pray that we would never cross paths with the nightmare-inducing creature called Nefertari again. I was patrolling the trails and doing a routine check around Rocky Mountain National Park ensuring that everything was in order and the camping grounds and picnic areas were clean. I walked towards one of the most remote picnic sites when a chilling wail in the distance made me halt in my tracks. My heart began to race as I gazed into the surrounding trees, trying to find its source. At this moment, I received a radio call from my colleague, Jerry. He sounded visibly unnerved as he spoke. Hey man, did you hear that strange sound just now? I replied hurriedly. Yes, I'm heading in that direction, stay put. We don't want to take any unnecessary risks. As I cautiously continued toward the sound, clouds began to gather overhead, casting an eerie gloom over the once picturesque park. The air temperature dropped, and I pulled my jacket tighter. Suddenly, I stumbled upon a grisly scene. Fresh blood splattered on the ground near an overturned picnic table and broken dishes scattered all around. My pulse quickened. Something terrible had happened here. I took a deep breath and called for backup on my radio. While waiting for my colleagues to arrive, I explored the site further and found strange tracks leading away from the bloody mess. The footprints were like nothing I had ever seen before, large and wide with claw-like imprints on what seemed like a bipedal creature. My fellow rangers soon joined me at the scene. They were equally baffled by this mysterious sight. As we inspected the area more closely, Jane, another ranger with years of experience in this park, whispered to us, I think we might be dealing with something straight out of folklore. With several rangers accompanying me now, we cautiously decided to follow the bizarre trail deeper into the forest. Fear tainted our senses as every snapping twig or rustling leaf made us jumpy. Our nerves were on edge as we moved as one uneasy unit through the looming shadows. Not long after, we stumbled upon a grisly sight. An injured camper lay near a torn tent, bleeding profusely from multiple gashes on his body. We immediately called medical assistance and did our best to comfort the terrified man. In hushed tones, he described being viciously attacked by a grotesque creature with large, piercing eyes and razor-sharp teeth. Jerry eyed the forest warily as he muttered under his breath, We need to tell the other visitors to vacate the area. I nodded, equally concerned about public safety. While medical services rushed to help the injured camper, we went around the park and urged people to leave immediately. Panic seemed to set in as campers and picnickers grabbed their backpacks and hastily made their way back toward their cars. As night fell and rain began to stream down from a stormy sky, we stayed out near the initial bloody site armed with spotlights and rifles. We'd decided that if this creature was indeed some horrifying monster from folklore, it might return seeking another victim. Hours passed without any sign of the monstrous attacker. Tiredness began to affect us as we huddled close together, watching for any sign of movement in the dark forest around us. Suddenly, without warning, a large, shadowy figure lunged out from behind a thick curtain of branches and charged towards us with terrifying speed. We tried to warn the park visitors and close off the area, but it was clear that we didn't have enough time. The creature moved relentlessly, attacking anything and anyone in its path. One by one, our fellow rangers and innocent campers were targeted. Their bodies were left mutilated beyond recognition. 
Despite our best efforts, there was no way we could keep up with this monstrosity or attempt to subdue it. The local law enforcement had been notified, but reaching a remote location like this would take time, and we knew that fast action was crucial to saving as many lives as possible. The grisly murders continued throughout the night. It seemed like every hour brought another blood-curdling scream echoing through the forest. As the senior ranger on sight, I felt the weight of each death on my shoulders. I wanted desperately to do something, anything, to stop this ruthless killer. Perhaps it was reckless of us not to retreat further or call for additional outside help but seeing what this creature was capable of doing, it was hard not to act with a sense of urgency. Our fear for others propelled us forward even though, deep down, we knew that we were not equipped to confront such a monster. Eventually, all activity ceased. No more screams, no more signs of life in the area. We held our breaths as deafening silence blanketed the forest around us like a thick fog. Reluctantly regrouping near a makeshift campsite under the trees large enough for some shelter from the rain, we felt an air of defeat hang heavy above us. The next day brought grim tidings. Every single camper within the park's perimeter had been attacked, with few survivors left standing. The remaining park visitors recounted their horrific experiences, each one's tale more gruesome than the last. It was then that an elderly Native American man approached me slowly and offered his knowledge of this creature that had terrorized our once serene refuge. His voice trembled as he explained that it was only spoken about in whispered horror stories and legends passed down through generations. His people had never dared to speak its name louder than a whisper, fearing the reality it brought closer. With one more glance at the dark trees surrounding us, I turned back to the old man. I pleaded with him. We needed to know what we were dealing with, what we had lost so many lives to. He sighed deeply, then finally uttered the name of our predator. Wendigo. The word hung in the air as an icy chill ran through us, fueled both by the ominous stories and last night's unfathomable carnage. This deadly creature had left trails of blood and terror in its wake, and now it carried a name so chilling that uttering it felt almost sinful. As we huddled under the rain-soaked canopy of trees that had once seemed comforting, I couldn't help but wonder if we would ever truly know safety and solace in these woods again. The Wendigo was still out there. Our enemy now had a name but remained untouched, a malicious force hiding in plain sight amongst the shadowy depths of the forest. It was only a matter of time before it would strike again, and there was little any of us could do to stop it. Gruesome Encounter of the Mythic Hunter From Silent Eagle 92 Just another typical morning for me. This happened to me on June 20th, 1995. As a Sioux Native American with a rather uncommon name, Kenton Smallmouth, I lived in the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. My family had been living there since forever, and we valued our heritage. I worked at a convenience store in the nearby town and led a simple life out of the city's chaos. I had always been very attached to my three nephews, Danny, Dale, and Eric, almost treating them like my own children since my sister passed away five years ago in a tragic accident. On that day, in June 1995, my nephews and I decided to have our regular Sunday hike around the hills. Eric was wildly enthusiastic about nature and liked reading old folklore stories about mysterious creatures or events within these forests. We set off early in the morning with a packed lunch prepared by their mother, eager for our hiking adventure. 
Danny always carried a Swiss knife just to feel safe walking through the forest paths. We took one of our well-known routes but were delighted to stumble upon an unexplored path veering off from the usual trail. Dale was eager to explore it while Danny seemed unsure. Finally, we all agreed on this new adventure, imagining ourselves as fearless nature pioneers. The path led us to a secluded meadow where we saw something truly bizarre an old tree that looked like it had been struck down by lightning years ago. Its branches twisted chaotically. There, on one of its charred branches, lay what seemed like clothes torn apart by wild animals, tattered rags covered in dried blood stains. Danny was spooked by what he discovered and urged us all to report it to the local authorities just as soon as we left this place. We were about to leave when Eric sheepishly asked me if I noticed a weird smell. I did, like a mix of decaying animals and acrid smoke. It was then that I spotted strange gouge marks on the tree bark, as if something had been clawing at it viciously. Feeling uneasy, we hastily made our way back to the familiar trail, unable to shake the feeling of being watched by something lurking in the shadows. We carried on our hike and ate lunch with heavy hearts, uneasy about what we might have stumbled upon earlier. As evening approached, we decided to turn back and head home. Darkness began to envelop the forest earlier than usual, or so it seemed to us. We started hearing strange sounds nearby, branches snapping and something heavy moving through the underbrush. Suddenly, there was a blood-curdling scream not too far from where we were. Eric thought it sounded like his friend from school, Timmy. While Dale called for help on his cell phone, Danny and I cautiously approached where we had heard the scream. We came across a scene that sent chills down our spines. Human-like footprints marked with deep scratches that suggested claws as well as shattered wood pieces all around. It seemed like the creature had dragged Timmy's lifeless body into the woods when we saw a broken necklace with his name on it lying nearby. Then we heard rustling noises echoing behind us. We quickly gathered our friends and tried to call for help again, but Dale's phone had lost signal, and the dense forest blocked any chance of reaching a connection. We knew we had to get out of there as fast as we could. We continued down the trail towards our exit, constantly alert and tense. The rustling noises and snapping branches seemed to be getting closer, but there was never any sign of what was causing them. Our pace quickened as an overwhelming sense of urgency took over. We all avoided looking back into the darkness behind us, knowing that would only make things worse. As we raced through the woods, we came across a small cabin. The door was left slightly ajar. Hesitantly, we entered, knowing it might be our only chance at temporary safety. We closed the door tightly behind us and huddled together in silence, hoping that whatever was out there wouldn't find us. Hours passed by in the dark cabin without any incidents. The noises from outside seemed to have stopped entirely and our fear began to subside slightly. We knew it wasn't safe to stay there much longer, so we decided that as soon as daylight broke, we would make a final push to leave the forest. When morning came, we cautiously emerged from the cabin and hurried along the trail that would lead us back home. As we reached the edge of the forest, we felt a mix of relief and sadness wash over us. Relief for having made it out alive but sadness for the loss of Timmy and what he must have gone through. After emerging from the woods, we made our way to the nearest police station to report everything that had happened. The officers took our statements seriously and conducted a search in the forest with reinforcements but found no signs of life or evidence regarding Timmy's whereabouts. As time went on, I couldn't help but research similar cases in our area's past. There were always rumors of strange encounters and disappearances in that forest. 
After some extensive digging, I found out that what we had encountered was a terrifying creature known as the Strig, an ancient demon that fed off the life force of its victims. Its gruesome attacks on humans were documented throughout history, with countless reports of horrific maulings, torture, and death. Nowadays, most consider the strike to be nothing more than a macabre legend or the stuff of nightmares. But those who have encountered it know just how real and horrifying it can be. Every so often, I will come across a news headline about another person missing in that forest, and my mind drifts back to that nightmarish experience. Let's not meet again, strike.